Hey, good afternoon. So we'll make a start. I think we have a couple of minutes uh, delayed, but that's all right. Welcome to the University of Western Australia Institute of Agriculture Postgraduate Showcase. We termed uh, 18 years ago Frontiers in Agriculture. It's really the frontiers, the front end of uh, agriculture, not only in this university, but in terms of uh, the state. Before we getting started, I wish to acknowledge that University of Western Australia is situated on Noongar land and that Noongar people remain the spiritual and cultural custodians of their land and continue to practice their values, languages, beliefs and knowledge. And it's wonderful to see so many um, faces, particularly our postgraduate students and there are some undergraduate students here today. So. Today marks a very special day for us, 17th annual postgraduate showcase since the re-establishment of the UWA Institute of Agriculture in 2007. So I can tell that I haven't missed any of these events. So last night I flew from New Delhi via Singapore just to attend that. And uh, in the academic ranking of world universities uh, in 2022, which is uh, last year, UWA was ranked 15th in the world and number one in Australia in agriculture. I don't think many people realize that that is the fact. And sometimes I argue with my colleagues in the University of Queensland. They say they are number one. Maybe number one in different rankings, but certainly not in the academic ranking of world universities. And we are waiting for the new ranking, which will come uh, sometimes in um, July, August. The UWA Institute of Agriculture has played a significant role in achieving this glo global reputation by integrating research, education, training, and communication, more importantly in agriculture, and related natural resource management across the university, and also reaching out to our partners within Australia, but also, more importantly, internationally. The postgraduate showcase brings together some of the UWA's best uh, PhD students to share their research in agriculture and related areas. They're not necessarily uh, the best because there are other students, but we select the students based on where they are in terms of their career. So we want to have them at least they uh, can uh, reach 50% of their PhD or more. Uh, it's through a nomination where we invite from the heads of the schools, uh, supervisors, uh, discipline leaders and others, then they nominate. And then Rosanna and I sit together and select uh, based on making sure that different combinations of students are here. So this afternoon you will hear from seven PhD candidates from three schools in this case. Sometimes we get up to four to five schools. James. The presentations are divided into two sessions with a short break in between for afternoon tea. So I believe some will come and go, but uh, I encourage you to stay because supporting your course students uh, and, and fellows. I'm sorry to say that uh, the Director General of the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development for her first official visit to the university was supposed to be today. Ms. Heather Bryford is unwell. I think, I believe it's a COVID, still lingering around. Unable to present this special today, even today. However, it is extremely fitting and quite special that we are instead of joining by Deputy Chief Scientist, Dr. Ben Bidder. You see, Ben has actually attended this event, I was just talking to you previously, not as an audience member, but as a postgraduate showcase presenter himself. That was our first uh, postgraduate showcase. I was also telling that he was featured in one of the friend covers. So if you feature in UWA Institute of Agriculture friend cover, you will go into high heights. So <laughs> Tim Colmer is, uh, was our friend feature, feature in the first one, and now he's uh, Senior Deputy Vice Chancellor, our boss here. You see, Ben has actually attended this previously, uh, but also um, fond memories uh, of standing up here and student back in 2007. So Ben has more than 15 years since he has attended this. Ben completed his postgraduate studies at UWA during which he also recipient of the Mike Carroll Travel Fellowship. I believe that was also the first one shared with uh, a student from um, uh, South America, Argentina. I am sure that he has clearly achieved a great deal in this time. Ben is a key member of the primary industry's executive team, driving to develop, 
and implement strategies designed to build and enhance the department's scientific research consistent with industry requirements. Ben works with the executive team to coordinate and support research across departs grains, farming system, livestock, horticulture, and aquaculture research teams. So this is quite a big portfolio. And this is why I said to students to come for this kind of uh, show so I can really mingle with the industry people. And I'm sure that Ben will be looking for some bright students to join his team, not necessarily immediately, but in the coming years. Prior to this appointment, Ben spent over 20 years leading, managing, delivering research through throughput regional Western Australia and nationally uh, in affecting primary producers' production and profitability. Ben's main research focus has been in the agronomic research into abiotics, stress tolerance of cereals involving frost, drought, heat, pre-harvest sprouting, and grain quality. In, in fact, his PhD was on pre-harvest sprouting in wheat. Uh, then associate professor Julie Plummer and uh, Tim Setter from DEPERD. Ben is currently working on DEPERD and state level involvement in CRCs. We are working on a couple of CRCs together with the partners at Western Australian Agriculture Research Collaboration. Short form, WAC with CSARO, Grover Group Alliance, and the West Australian universities, that is Curtin, ECU, Murdoch, and UWA, as well as reinvigorating the primary industries, internal capacity building programs. So Ben has been advertising number of positions, uh, which is really refreshing to see that uh, uh, Western Australia is interested in primary industries, particularly agriculture. With that, I would like to warmly welcome to give his uh, keynote or opening address. Thank you. Thank you, Sadiq. And yes, Heather Brayford, our Director General, sends her apologies that she can't be with us today. Um, but it's quite fitting that I had to write a speech about two weeks ago and now I have to read the, my own speech that I wrote for her. <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks a lot for the opportunity. Um, I'm really delighted to see the range of research topics that we're going to see today. Um, I'm really excited about what you guys are going to present because essentially, you know, what you're presenting today will be what the industry is using for innovation and advancing our horizons in the near futures. Um, and you know, as we know, agriculture is an industry which brings together a multitude of disciplines um, across economics, crop physiology, agronomy, um, chemistry, biochemistry, um, AI, machine learning, data science um, are all new skills which are all coming into our, our areas. Um, and that's one of the things which makes our, our sectors such an interesting place to work in, that ability to work in such dynamic cross-discipline teams. And for my 20 year research career, that's what I really enjoyed was that opportunity to collaborate um, across institutions um, and across organisations and across disciplines. And I really encourage you guys um, as you know, in the second step of your career after post PhDs to really look forward to those opportunities where you can deliver that. Because that's where the next advancements in all of our industry sectors are going to be. Um, as a Chief Scientist of Primary Industries, I travel the state from Katanara to Esperance and work a lot with um, both our research stations and our collaborators and have a look at the amazing work that's conducted there. So Sadiq you know, gave a quick outline. We've got about 380 research staff which sit within that portfolio. I manage across grains, horticulture, uh, sorry, grains, livestock, farming systems, horticulture and aquaculture. Um, and we are essentially growing that R&D team. So there will be new opportunities uh, coming up. And hopefully we are in the process of implementing a graduate recruitment program, reinstating our graduate recruitment program, and that will kick in at the end of this year. Um, so definitely encourage the undergrads and postgrads to look at those opportunities as they come up. Um, obviously our department also works quite closely with the industry to make sure we have support for future long-term research programs and Sadiq touched on that with the West Australian Ag Research Collaboration. Um, that's really critical uh, for our sector to get better engaged with the universities and with the academic system to make sure that we're working on industry problems and industry challenges um, and going forward. And the West Australian Ag Research Collaboration is one opportunity to do that. So essentially we've got 25 million from State Treasury over the next three financial years to essentially try and build that mid-career capability at that postdoc and PhD level um, to work with the industry placements for those PhD students going forward. So that's something that I'm really excited to be working on and championing. Um, we hope to have uh, the director for that announced shortly, um, imminently. I had hoped we'd be able to announce it today but unfortunately that wasn't able to happen. 
Um, the first project for that collaboration was actually kicked off last week and announced by our minister, um, Jackie Jarvis, in collaboration with the NT equivalent minister, Paul Kirby, um, and that was essentially around um, enabling um, intensification of the northern beef system, so around using corn, cotton and cattle um, to essentially drive the diversity in our northern production environments through tropical beef finishing systems. Um, UWA is involved in that part of the project, and a special call out to Phil Verko if he's here. Is Phil in? Not yet. Um, to you know, really thank the UWA team who've helped pull one of those foundation projects for the collaboration together. Um, and yeah, and I guess you know, for you guys who are just finishing your PhDs or three quarters of the way through, this is going to give you opportunities in that postdoc experience um, for some of you going forward. Um, I don't really want to hold you back from listening to the exciting lineup of postgrad speakers because. I know how nervous they are, as I was there, as Sadiq pointed out, 17 years ago. Um, but yeah, I really look forward to hearing from you guys and what you've actually been working on um, and what the opportunities are for your research going forward. Um, and to quote Emeritus Professor Graham Martin after the first UWA postgrad, the future of agricultural research and succession planning in WA looks good. You guys are the next generation, we'll be fine. Um, so yeah, thank you, and I wish you all the best in your future careers. Thank you, Sadiq. Okay, this one, I don't know if the public servants will accept any bribe, but uh, this is a, a little question for you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. I think let us get on to the, the, the next session. So we'll have um, session one, um, and that will be shared by none other than uh, Associate Professor Matthias Leopold. It's timely that uh, Matthias is chairing our session as he took on the role of the head of the UWS School of Agriculture and Environment this year, early this year. And four of our presenters today are from SAGE, School of Ag and Environment, just it happened this year. Matthias is a highly qualified soil geomorphologist who came to UWA from the Technical University of Munich in Germany. His research focuses on different aspects of soil development, soil as archives of landscape history, and he's very passionate about that if you listen to his uh, lectures and talks, uh, especially to the field station and at uh, UWA farm. He's involved in various programs where he focuses on spatial distribution of soil water using shallow, high resolution geophysical techniques. Matthias is an active research participant in the Australian Critical Zone Network, which is uh, really headquartered at the UWA farm Pinchley but with the five sites across the country, including at the farm. This is a platform to study connections between air, water, soil, it means atmosphere. So please welcome Matthias. Thank you, Thank you very much, Sidik. Thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to introduce the various speakers, the first four. And it's a delight to be here and basically chair this session. So my first, actually, um, acknowledgement is to Dorait Akish Zabi, and he is from the UWA School of Agriculture and Environment. Dorait is an animal biologist from Iraq. He obtained his bachelor's degree in animal production in Iraq, then moved to Australia to chase his passion in improving production and reproduction in livestock. He was awarded a bachelor's degree with first-class honors and a master's degree from UWA in animal biology. His research focuses on livestock production, reproduction, nutrition, and animal behavior in terms of diet preference. His supervisors are Associate Professor Dominic Bloch, Professor Shane Maloney, Dr. Haley Norman, Dr. Dean Thomas, and Dr. Kelsey Poole together with Dr. Serena Hancock, so a whole supervisory team that's really good to see, and that's awesome that this is a collaboration out of those ones. Today, you will be hearing about his postgraduate research on the negative impact of heat stress on sperm quality in merino rams and how to mitigate the damaging effect of heat stress on sperm quality by using antioxidant nutrition. Please welcome Doriat. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias, for the introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, I uh, welcome you very warmly. Today, I'll be talking about a component of my PhD 
uh, long-lasting PhD. Uh, it's about melatonin and the antioxidant properties of uh, melatonin in, in mitigating the negative impact of heat stress on sperm. We all heard about global warming and heat stress. And there is a good body of evidence suggesting that heat stress can impact and compromise sperm quality in merino rams. This, this is especially very important because breeding season coincides during summer where heat is very high, but also nutrients and, and uh, pastures, green lush pastures that are full of antioxidants are also limited. So these rams may already have a compromised sperm quality. And that may lead to infertility or even subfertility, leading to poor reproductive outcomes in, in terms of how many lambs we'll get per year. And that means loss in profitability to the farmers, and even we may end up having a lot of animal welfare issues in our hands. So for me, it's very important to look into ways to, to, to mitigate the impact of uh, heat stress uh, on, on, on the spam. So my first question is, can melatonin, as an antioxidant, Rescue sperm quality from the oxidative damage of heat stress. So just briefly, what is oxidative stress? Oxidative stress is induced by heat and as well as other stressors, but for me, heat stress is the main thing here. So heat stress actually induces the production of reactive oxygen species. These species are very reactive and the la they lack of an electron and they challenge other cells and steal electrons from them. Therefore, the cells may die uh, later on and turn into reactive oxygen species. Increased reactive oxygen species and at the same time, lack of, lack of antioxidant supply causes oxidative stress. Why melatonin? We all may heard about melatonin and it is a, um, a hormone that regulates circadian rhythms, but also it has a, uh, an antioxidant antioxidant properties and it contributes to the antioxidant pathways in tackling the reactive oxygen species. This is, this is what I'm going to talk to you about, about this antioxidant. Can melatonin maintain sperm quality in marina during exposure to heat? To test this question, I ran an experiment at UWA Future Farm in West Pangeli. I had two groups of rams, one 15 each, one control, used as control, and another uh, provided with melatonin and the melatonin I used here was regulin that was implanted under the ram's ears and that's a long-lasting uh, melatonin. So these two groups individually were introduced to a teaser U that stimulates their sexual behavior and they mounted the U and then I collected the sperm from these rams using the artificial vagina and the spams underwent several stages of processing. The first one we looked at, at the farm, uh, we looked at spam motility. We used computer-assisted spam analysis called CASA. We also looked at sp uh, spam volume, spam concentration. We used a spectrophotometer to assess that. And then the samples were frozen for spam, uh, as spam pellets and similar plasma for proteomics and bioinformatics analysis that, the, that will be done later. I have to say that the, what I'm going to present for this part is a preliminary data because my experiment only finished last week. So the, the experiment went for 12 weeks in total. And Along with that, with, with spam collection, we also recorded the, uh, the uh, weather condition at the farm where the, the, the rams were, were actually situated. So these rams had experienced the same weather condition. They underwent the same uh, you know, the temperatures and the, 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 during summer. So uh, this graph shows temperature humidity index, which is a measure of heat stress. It combines temperature and humidity. So anything above 20, THI 20, above 27, is see, it's deemed stressful to the animals. These are the weeks on which I collected the sperm from these rams. And on week two, the melatonin was implanted. And here is the joining period where we had to let the uh, rams to join the use as a normal practice for the farm. So. What we found with the melatonin in terms of motility total, which is the, the movement of sperm in any direction, 
which is the top graph, and the bottom graph is motility progressive, which is an important one because the progressive means the sperm moves forward. Uh, and that's what actually uh, uh, this uh, type of uh, sperm that's moving forward has the potential to actually uh, fertilize the egg. So in both, in both uh, motility measures, we found no melatonin effect on, on the sperm quality so far. I have uh, three or uh, four more weeks to include in these uh, graphs, uh, so it, it may tell us a different story there. Uh, in terms of spam volume and concentration, again, melatonin had no effect on, on, uh, on the volume, nor on the, uh, on the concentration of the sperm across the 12-week uh, period or nine-week period of uh, semen collection. So. I have to say that we, uh, I have samples to do the proteomics, which is uh, protein studies and also bioinformatics analysis that is yet to be done. And here we may, we may, have, uh, we may have a different story. So it's not the end of the story here. These parameters may tell us uh, uh, another story. So, so in parallel to, to the RAM study, I also uh, applied the same uh, question and, and tested it on another model and looked at if melatonin can actually mitigate the negative impact of heat. And, and the model I use here is, is Drosophila melanogaster. For those who haven't heard about Drosophila melanogaster, it's a fruit fly and it's been a very powerful model in terms of testing biological processes and relating them to, to mammals. So Drosophila has got life short, uh, the advantage of that Drosophila has got short lifespan, which means we can do multi-generational studies in a, in a short uh, uh, amount of time, while with sheep and other mammals, uh, we need hundreds of years to do that. Uh, it's got a rapid generational turnover, which means we can generate thousands of them at the lab level. It's low cost to run, which is a good thing. But also they have a similar uh, biological processes to mammals in terms of reproduction and the sperm. I must say Drosophila has got the longest sperm that we know of so far. It's about 20 times longer than the body of the, uh, itself and it's about 1,000 times longer than the human sperm. That's just like a, as a matter of fact. So to test the same question on Drosophila, I had two groups, room temperature, normal temperature and heat stress. Males were collected at, at two days old. They were uh, housed in, in Drosophila vials. Each vial had 20 uh, uh, males. And they were offered two types of food, control and melatonin, at lower levels, obviously, because uh, you know, it's different than, than sheep. And, and both, both uh, uh, treatment groups underwent uh, 12 hours of, of darkness and 12 hours of light. And this is a normal environmental condition for Drosophila that likes. The uh, room temperature underwent 25, hour, uh, 25 uh, degrees temperature all the time, whilst the heat stress group underwent a slightly different heat profile. So during um, light cycle, it went, uh, the temperature was increased to 34 degrees for eight hours, and for the rem remainder of the time, the temperature was 25. So we are simulating what happens out there, uh, like eight hours of the, uh, of the day when we experience uh, heat. Um, <clears throat> and then what I did with these males, uh, sorry, humidity was 65% again for all groups, and the, the um, experiment underwent 14 days, which is uh, the time that uh, is enough for us to cover the spermatogenesis in, in, in Drosophila to see any effect or, or any impact of heat. So these the males uh, from both groups were rip, uh, paired with a female, a virgin female, and the reason why I'm saying virgin here is because we, I'm interested to look at the male side uh, effects. So the, the, male, uh, the female has to be a virgin female and has mated and never exposed to any treatments before. So whatever comes out of that female is actually representing the sperm from the male. So these pairs were housed again in, 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 uh, in vials and the reproductive outcomes of, of each one of those pairs were, was measured later. But in addition to that, I also uh, dissected uh, a lot of flies, a lot of males, and collected their sperm and looked at them uh, real time at the lab 
looked at and measured life sperm uh, measurements as well on those uh, sperm samples. So let's have a look at the reproductive outcomes. What are they? Number of eggs laid in a vial. So the, I, I counted the number of eggs laid on each, uh, on each vial, number of pupae produced from these eggs, and then number of new flies or new emergence from these uh, flies that are coming out of each single pair from each treatment group. In addition to the reproductive outcomes, I looked at uh, life sperm measurements, so one of which is membrane lipid peroxidation, membrane lipid disorder, mitochondrial membrane potential, mitochondrial superoxide. So these are measures of oxidative stress. So when sperm is stressed, we, we can see an elevated levels of these measures uh, at, at the sperm level. So when these changes happen to the, to the sperm, we can say that sperm is in, a, in an intense metabolic stress it's experiencing apoptotic-like changes and potentially cell death. So what did we find? In terms of number of eggs laid, we found a significant effect of heat. So the heat actually knocked down the number of eggs laid by these females. And unfortunately, we didn't see any melatonin effect at, uh, in terms of egg production. In terms of number of pupae, again, same story, significant effect of heat and no melatonin uh, effect on, 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 on the number of pupae produced. And same story with number of flies, heat effect, significant effect, which we expect already, but no melatonin effect on, on, the, on the treatment groups uh, between uh, uh, control and heat stress groups. However, looking at the spam parameters, we looked at, uh, as I mentioned, high mitochondrial membrane potential, we found uh, no effect of heat, but there was an effect of melatonin in there. So melatonin actually reduced high mitochondrial membrane potential there. So it, may, it means it might be because these, this melatonin is scavenging the reactive oxygen species and reducing the high mitochondrial membrane potential on, on the sperm. So melatonin here reduces the mitochondrial potential of the sperm in heat-stressed flies. Again, with membrane lipid peroxidation, no difference in the, between uh, treatment groups, control and melatonin in, in, in room temperature. However, there was a difference in between uh, the control and melatonin group in heat stress. So again, here, melatonin reduces membrane lipid peroxidation in heat stressed flies. With uh, membrane lipid disorder, which is another indicator, uh, no difference between the um, uh, control and melatonin groups in, in room temperature, in control group, and the significant difference here in terms of, of uh, melatonin having it uh, reducing the membrane lipid disorder. And finally, mitochondrial superoxide, no difference, and then difference in heat stress groups. Melatonin is working there as well. This is statistical difference. We may we, we can say it's statistically different, but bi if, if it's biologically different, that's another story which may need to uh, do more work to look at the reproductive outcomes of these males and so on to confirm the sperm is being actually rescued by melatonin. So here again, melatonin reduces mitochondrial superoxide of the sperm. So in summary, uh, in marine rams, my preliminary data uh, shows that there is no effect of melatonin on sperm uh, motility, volume, and concent uh, concentration. Uh, however, I've got a lot of samples to analyze for protein studies and, and, and bioinformatic analysis to be done, and these may tell us a completely different story. In Drosophila melanogaster, melanin has no, melatonin has no effect on the reproductive outcomes, like number of eggs, pupae, and flies. However, melat melatonin uh, has the potential to reduce or reduces the damaging effect of oxidative stress on the sperm. So it has the, the ability to scavenge these reactive oxygen species and, and, and detoxify their negative effect. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I should say. Uh, so we, we have done a lot of literature review and we compiled data from the literature review and we found the melatonin level that we're using actually regularly in, in Merino is the one that has been used already uh, in, in Merino, but in Drosophila 
we found the, the, the threshold, the safe threshold for melatonin to be used in, 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 in Drosophila without any negative effect on, on their, you know, on their uh, biological processes. So it was all based on the literature review and the data we, we, we compiled from there. Thank you for a great talk. Um, and very topical at the moment with ongoing increases in temperature. Um, obviously, fertility across our livestock species is going to be quite important. Um, I did see some work presented last week um, in Darwin around fertility of the northern rangelands um, indica species with um, the integration of genetics from India um, into those buffalo, uh, sorry, into both buffalo as well as um, cows in the northern rangelands. Have you, is there any work in literature around that from um, genetic studies looking at heat stress changes with um, fertility in merinos? Uh, so yes, there, there are studies that have been done like in terms of heat stress and merinos, but based on my literature review, I didn't see any um, evidence out there that looked at antioxidant nutrition in merinos during exposure to heat. And this is what it brought my project in, in, in life there. But yes, there is an uh, uh, evidence of uh, genetic-wise, like uh, looking at uh, different uh, gene expressions like uh, HP70, I guess. It's his stress shock uh, gene. Um, I hope I answered that question. Yeah, and a second question. If you go back to your slide where you presented the time course of when you sampled when you applied yep. melatonin, um, you applied your melatonin quite late after all of the heat stress events um, had actually occurred in your merinos. Is it likely that an earlier Oops, application, um, uh, <laughs> earlier sorry. application may have? Um, this is not the. That's all right. You can thing. probably answer it without it. That, that you you basically applied it at the end of summer when your rams had already been exposed to considerable heat stress. Yes. Um, is there any work which has looked at the effect if you applied it as a preventive effect? treatment before the heat stress, do you expect you may have got a different result? Uh, absolutely. There might be a different results, but also what we know is that heat, the if impact of heat stress on, on, on sperm can last for eight, uh, eight months after the exposure. So we're pretty much uh, working in a zone that we may pick up an effect, even the heat stress event went uh, three or four months before. So I guess the, the, the question here is that, um, we may, if I ha we had this experiment, uh, say two months before, we might, we, we wouldn't probably be able to pick up a, a, a spam, like a damaging effect of heat stress on, on, on the spam, and therefore we decided to do it later on, so we may see some damaging effect that lasts after the heat exposure. I think that's the fascinating, yeah. whenever you put out questions, there is more questions, yeah. and you've got a couple of uh, good hints, basically, yeah. that can pull up your can, study. Yeah. You want to quickly answer? Yeah, you? sorry. Um, with that, uh, uh, yeah, uh, spermatogenesis in rams take a long time for the sperm to actually mature. Um, and, 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 and for us to control the history of the rams beforehand and also look at what, they've been, what they have experienced before, uh, it's a bit logistically uh, difficult to be honest uh, but what we want is the, the rams came from the same flock and 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 whatever they experienced they should have experienced the same uh, weather conditions and the only difference here what, when we divided them into two groups is that one of them had melatonin and and if we pick up a difference in between these uh, animals you know two groups given that they have the same history um, I mean, presumably, because they came out from the paddocks, uh, so uh, then it, it must be the melatonin that is actually doing something. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please, please, please come with me. Stay with me. Oh, please. sorry. Just want to really congratulate you all Thank for you. the presentation. Thanks. You did a Thanks great much. job. Yes. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank and you. All the best for your future career. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. While they change the microphone, I want to present our next speaker, which is Samalka Wajivira from the School of Molecular Sciences. Samalka is a plant biologist, and you see we have this wide range of different disciplines, a plant biologist from Sri Lanka. She obtained her honors degree in plant biotechnology, it's first class, from the University of Colombo, Sri Lanka. 
while working as an assistant lecturer at the Department of Plant Sciences, <clears throat> Salmarka was awarded with the UWA RTP scholarship and a Forest Research Foundation scholarship to pursue her research in plant biochemistry. She joined the UWA School of Molecular Sciences and here within the ARC Center of Excellence in Plant Energy Biology under the supervision of Professor Harvey Miller and Dr. Owen Duncan, she is currently carrying out her research on finding out molecular mechanisms <coughs> responsible for the salinity tolerance in wheat, so a very important topic. Today, she will be exploring salt tolerance mechanisms in metabolism and mitochondrial function in wheat. Please welcome with me. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. I'm Samalka Vijayvira. Uh, I would like to take you a journey through some of my findings uh, from past three years at UWA. So the two, uh, topic today is salt tolerance mechanisms in metabolism and mitochondrial function in weight. First, I would like to acknowledge my supervisors, uh, Professor Harvey Miller and Dr. Owen Duncan, for their continuous encouragement and support, and the Department of Primary Industries, Western Australia, for their collaboration, the University of Western Australia and Forest Research Foundation for funding my work. Let's see why salinity stress is important to be explored by a wheat cultivator. Salinity being a major abiotic stress, it limits agricultural productivity and it is observed that nearly 20% of world's agricultural land is affected by soil stress, including 30% of Australia's arable land. So wheat being a low soil tolerant crop, it, salinity could cause up to 60% yield loss in wheat, a big number. So our concern is how do we improve the soil tolerance in wheat? So in order to improve soil tolerance, we need to know what soil tolerance mechanisms are available in the plant. Iron exclusion is one of the major mechanisms of sanity tolerance, which is using specific transporters, recognize the excessive amount of salt in the tissues and actively pump them out back into the soil solution. This is an easily transferable and a proven method to increase yields, but it is energetically expensive and at some point with the increasing soil concentrations in the soil, this mechanism fails. So we need a more energetically less expensive and sustainable method of soil tolerance. That would be indeed tissue tolerance. Why is it? So tissue tolerance is a method uh, to adapt metabolism to function under high soil concentrations in the tissues. So the plant will no longer pump out ions. They could photosynthesize while accumulating high levels of salts in the leaves. So this again is a common method observed in halophytes and it, uh, that make them tolerate high levels of salt even greater than that of seawater. So, the negative point is, this is a complex multigenic trait. It will be hard to transfer between different crop varieties. But we have some light at the end of the road. So barley, being a very close relative of wheat, could tolerate two times all than what wheat does. So there should be wheat genotypes that are more salt tolerant. So if we could find one, then there will be more opportunities to transfer these phenotypic these uh, uh, responses to the uh, more susceptible bread wheat lines. So here comes mocho, mocho de espiga branca, a genotype of wheat that is proven to be high salt tissue tolerant. It is because it could grow and yield under high salt concentration that is nearly 10 times more than a regular bread wheat line. So we assume that this particular genotype could possess high salt torrent metabolic adaptations that could be evident at molecular level and could be utilized in improving bread wheat for salt torrents. So my main focus is on um, shoot adaptation to sanity stress. 
So, let us see how well mocha could accumulate sodium in its leaf tissues um, under experimental conditions. So, mocha was tested against four other excluding bread wheat genotypes. I found out under control conditions, mocha could accumulate eight times more salt than the, more, the highest excluded genotype, Westonia next one. And this was four times more under 150 millimolar salt stress. So, with four to eight times more salt in the tissues, let's see how well mocha could perform physiologically. So, uh, when it comes to physiological performance, the salt to control ratio of physiological performance was graphed again the sodium content in the fourth leaf. Here you can see the excluding genotypes show of uh, their physiology shows a linear relationship with the increasing sodium content. But mucho being able to accumulate high levels of salt and being able to perform physiologically similar to these excluders, much or do not follow this uh, linear relationship. So, we tested photosynthesis, whole plant dry weight. Further, we looked into stomatal conductance, intracellular CO2 content, transpiration, and uh, root shoot dry weight, chlorophyll content. In all the cases, much was standing out. This observation suggests that Mocho's ability to cope with high salt concentrations does not follow the general, general trend of a typical salt excluder, which was a great finding that makes us curious about how, the, how Mocho could, what are the underlying mechanisms <coughs> that make Mocho more salt tolerant and behave like this. So, in order to understand what molecular differences are evident in mocho in response to salinity that make it this unique. Let's see. So, uh, plant phenotype, as you all know, is defined by several different molecular mechanisms. First, by DNA, then transcribed into RNA, translated into proteins. So, protein are the main single uh, molecules that are directly affected by salt stress. So, proteins uh, uh, under salt stress, the protein complex integrity will be get affected, then the protein or enzyme activity will be get affected. Finally, the amount of metabolite will be defined by the enzyme activity, figuring out the plant's phenotype. So, my focus was from proteins to plant phenotype pathway. In order to understand the function of proteins in response to salinity, the first step I followed was profiling the proteome of the leaves of these wheat genotypes of interest. So, first I did a protein extraction and shotgun proteomic analysis to quantify nearly 3065 proteins. With this protein abundance data, I did a differentially abundant protein analysis to identify the proteins, protein functional categories, and metabolic pathways which are differentially affected under salt stress. So, using the differentially abundant protein analysis or DAP analysis, I found out in Mocho, in, um, as per a uh, subcellular localization level, mitochondrial localized differentially abundant proteins in mocho are significantly low when compared to other subcellular locations. And these numbers, when we, I compared them with other four genotypes I used in the study, uh, the mitochondrial differentially abundant proteins in mocho were significantly less than all the other genotypes. So, this observation determines that mitochondria in mocho behaves relatively differently. So, mitochondria is the organelle with, which hosts the interesting metabolic mechanism of energy metabolism. So, our next focus was on uh, mitochondrial energy metabolism. So, um, Let's see how mitochondrial energy metabolism is affected under soil stress. Mit energy metabolism mainly comprises of three main components, glycolysis, tricarboxylic acid cycle, and electron transportation chain. So, each of these mechanisms are denoted uh, with these respective symbols. So, we'll move on to the next slide. So, here I have done uh, uh, DAP analysis to identify how 
Energy metabolism in mocho is different from the uh, higher salt excluding genotype Westonia next one. So as you can see in Westonia next one, all three components of energy metabolism seems to be decreasing activity under salt stress, while in mocho all three components are conserved. Uh, conserved under salt stress. So this determines that energy metabolism in mocho is well preserved when compared to the excluder Westonia next one. Then I did a genotype comparison of mocho against Westonia next one under control and salt conditions independently. Under control conditions it was observed that TCA cycle and electron transportation chain in Mocho seems to be less active than in Westonia next one. But the interesting thing is, under salt conditions, glycolysis and TCA cycle in Mocho seems to be more active than in Westonia next one. So this seems energy metabolism in Mocho is more preserved under salt stress despite the high salt concentrations in its leaf tissues. So as a summary, out of the depth analysis, I could say that mitochondria in mocho has significantly low number of differentially abundant proteins, and mitochondrial energy metabolism in mocho seems to be unaffected by salt stress. So both of these observations say that the mitochondrial proteins in mocho could possess different protein kinetics or less lower salt liability than in other genotypes. So it would be really interesting to find out how protein complex integrity in mocho is different from a control genotype. So understand that first what I did was I did a protein complex integrity study in a control genotype uh, I understanding how well protein structure is conserved in a pro, uh, control genotype under salt stress. So as you all know, proteins will remain in the intact protein complex under control conditions. When subjected to salt stress, they will, get, they will fall apart into subunits, so the size of the complex reduce. So this difference in size would be helpful to understand how well a particular protein uh, complex is preserved under salt stress. So using size exclusion chromatography followed by mass spectrometry, I managed to identify a set of protein complexes in the mitochondria of a control genotype of wheat that are highly salt liable. So out of them, I found out that mitochondrial 2-oxoglutarate dehydrogenase complex is the most salt liable complex in a control genotype's mitochondria. So this was a great finding for me. So then my focus was to see how well 2-oxoglutarate dehydrogenase complex activity abundance in mocho would differ from a control genotype. So um, first, let's see why 2-oxoglutarate dehydrogenase is important as a protein. 2-oxoglutarate dehydrogenase is a key enzyme in the TCA cycle uh, or energy metabolism. So it uh, catalyzes the reaction of conversion of 2-oxoglutarate into succinyl CoA. So this metabolite 2-oxoglutarate is a highly important metabolite in carbon metabolism, nitrogen metabolism, and many other metabolic pathways. So 2-oxoglutarate dehydrogenase protein that sits at crossroads between carbon and nitrogen metabolism will control the flow of 2 oxoglutarate dehydrogenase into TCA cycle. So indeed, 2-oxoglutarate dehydrogenase complex will be very interesting. So um, my next focus was to see the 2-oxoglutarate dehydrogenase abundance and activity uh, under salt conditions in mocho versus other genotypes. So first, moving on to the uh, abundance. So under salt stress, 2-oxoglutarate dehydrogenase subunit abundance in the control genotypes was significantly reduced, uh, but in mocho, this abundance was more or less preserved, like the difference was not significant. That determines that 2-oxoglutarate dehydrogenase complex abundant in mocho is not affected by salt stress. Then I was looking into the enzyme activity. Comparing 2-oxoglutarate dehydrogenase activity in mocho with the control genotype septa. So 
uh, with increasing soil concentrations when the 2 oxobutyrate dehydrogenase activity was tested in Mocho and Scepter, it was observed that in Mocho, uh, 2 oxobutyrate dehydrogenase activity shows a significant reduction only at 200 millimolar source stress. But in the control genotype sector, this difference was obde started observing at 150 millimolar source stress. So, Mocho shows a significant loss only at 200, but SEPTA shows it at 150. So, further, I this was in mitochondrial stromal proteins, and further, I purified the 2 oxybutyrate dehydrogenase complex from mitochondrial stroma and did the pure, uh, enzyme activity assay to identify that. A mocho to oxybutyrate dehydrogenase does not show a significant reduction uh, of activity by 150 millimolar soil stress, but in SEPTER there was a 55 percent reduction of activity by 150 millimolar soil stress. So, the, these observations summarize that mocho's 2 oxybutyrate dehydrogenase complex is relatively more tolerant to soil stress than in SEPTER. So, it comes to the end of my observations. As a summary, I could say Shoots of mocho showed a greater tolerance to salinity despite its high soil concentrations in the tissues. And mitochondrial energy metabolism was more preserved in mocho under soil stress. And with multiple molecule analysis, I managed to find out that mocho's 2 oxybutyrate dehydrogenase could be a point of high soil tissue tolerance. So, further, we could say that identifying these types of salt torrent protein isoforms in mocho would support efficient transfer of genes and breeding bread weed for soil tissue tolerance. And it will meet our requirement of treating the hunger and heal in this world. Thank you so much for listening to my talk. And um, and, I'm, yeah, and I'm open for your questions and suggestions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that was a very interesting talk, uh, Samelka. Um, you. you mentioned at the start that barley has greater salt tolerance than wheat, and um, I'd like to know how the salt tolerance of mocho compares with that of barley, and also whether the sorts of metabolic differences that you have uh, identified are present in barley. Yeah, I have not done a molecular analysis of uh, um, barley. I'm, I'm referring to the literature. So barley possesses high level of salt accumulation than uh, mocho, uh, sorry, uh, wheat. And also like uh, barley could uh, sustain under high salt concentrations. Like, you, like barley is used at, as a control when testing uh, wheat for uh, salinity tolerance and salinity fields in some literature. So um, I can't exactly say what molecular mechanisms happen, but uh, like the response Barley is a very close relative of wheat, and the structure and everything is the same. So generally, the response will be of any uh, plant when it is subjected to soil stress. They will show osmotic uh, stress, ionic stress, and um, um, and imbalances. All these things are common to all um, non-soil tolerant crops. So. Uh, I'm not sure what's exactly happening inside barley. I'm uh, like, I'm sorry uh, that it's not very really helpful the answer. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so. Additional question? Most of the they are very similar to some similar to this product. Yeah, so mocho is a, a land race, so it shows it's, uh, the, the physiology is quite different from a uh, regular bread wheat line. So it is very large, like the, the um, fresh weight is very high, and the grain yield is relatively low. So our concern is picking the mechanisms of salt tolerance from mocho 
and putting it in a um, higher yielding genotype so that we have both uh, characteristics in one plant. So um, yes, mocho is not very high yielding plant and even under control conditions, uh, but the yield drop is quite low under soil stress. I think that's a that's a very very quick one. That's a good answer because you need to transfer the, the gene because they are land races. My question is uh, a very nice talk. Um, where does this salt get accumulated? Have you looked at uh, uh, in the leaf tissue, in the vac holes? So where does this salt accumulate in mature? Yeah. So I haven't looked into the organelle level, but I see that in the uh, so in the leaf salt accumulation study, I did. Uh, um, I did uh, sections through the leaf developmental gradient. So I saw a higher accumulation of salt in the base of the leaf than in the tip. So my first, ob first thinking was because the leaf was dying from the tip to the base. So I was assuming that tip could be the place where more salt could be observed, but it is not the case. Base accumulates more sodium. But um, uh, so sodium and potassium, both. And um, yeah, it was the same in all five genotypes. So, um, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we were like planning to do it, but with my, uh, with my timing and all, we like just hauled it and, course, and okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Lots of yeah. things. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you again. so much. Thank you very much. I also want to congratulate you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to continue in our program while the speakers change again the microphone and just introduce our third speaker today, which is Sylvester Obengdarko from the School of Biological Sciences. Sylvester previously worked in a molecular, as, a, as a molecular pathologist by developing molecular diagnostic tools for screening plant pathogens and is now at the finishing stage of his PhD studies in plant sciences. He's a recipient of the CRC Honeybee Product Scholarship, which has allowed him to complete his research on nectar production. In his PhD research, Sylvester has focused on the factors affecting sugars of and DHA variability and the biochemistry underlining DHA production in Leptospermum species floral nectar, while also furthering the biodiversity and ecological impact of these species. Under the supervision of Associate Professor Patrick Finnegan, Associate Professor Eric Veniklas, and Dr. Peter Brooks, he has made new findings through his research by identifying new species outside the genus Leptospermum with the capacity to accumulate DHA in the floral nectar and thereby expanding the resource availability <coughs> to produce non-peroxide based bioactive honey. I'm a beekeeper myself. I am looking forward to this talk, I must say. Please welcome Sil Sylvester. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias, for the introduction. Um, today, my talk is basically about the honey. I think everybody here in the room has had some bit experience or used honey before. And I'm going to talk on the other side of the base ingredients used for production or producing honey, that is nectar. In particular, one particular honey that has gained or is notoriously known for eight high premium is manuka honey. And manuka honey is derived from leptosperm species. So it's quite known all over the world that the uh, manuka honey has high strong bioactivity. And this bioactivity is not from hydrogen peroxide. Almost every honey has hydrogen peroxide as its bioactivity. But for manuka honey, its bioactivity is derived from dihydroxyacetone that is being converted into methylglyoxone. So throughout the whole flower life, nectar is produced. And when nectar is produced, there is some variability that goes on. And then we don't know what are the factors affecting this sort of variability. 
So if, if this is a, a typical Leptospermus species, that is Leptospermus coparium, and when the flower undergoes opening, you notice that um, it takes such a long time for nectar to accumulate. And throughout the whole flower life, nectar accumulation goes on. And at the full unfurling of the flower, nectar does not appear on the first day, but then it appears subsequently the second day. And then you see nectar just appearing there. And this nectar keeps on sitting on the flower surface. And bees will come collect it and use it for honey. The constituent of this nectar is what makes Leptospermus honey different or Manuka honey different. So what is flora nectar? So flora nectar is a currency or a reward that plants actually offer for pollination services. So plants will actually give nectar for its pollination services to source its pollination services. And it's also the main energy source for insect foragers because insects feed on nectar, it contains carbohydrates, contains all the nutrients, proteins in it, and therefore it's the main energy source for insect foragers. Again, nectar is, serves as a defense mechanism for the plant. Plant has to produce nectar to ward off other predators or other insects that want to destroy the plant. So then nectar forms that sort of a, a function in the plant. But importantly, nectar is a raw material for honey production. And that is where my interest is because honey has it's not been included in main clinical application for wound treatment because of a lot of anti- uh, resistance to a lot of uh, antimicrobial compounds. And nectar comes in handy as one of the least natural remedies that can, you can, easily, that can easily develop antimicrobial resistance. And one of such is Leptospermus species. And Manuka honey, or Leptospermus species, has been well been documented in New Zealand. And the production of honey from this species has gained a lot of attention in New Zealand, and New Zealand makes a lot of money out of it. And therefore, you have a whole lot of claims about Manuka honey. Everybody talks about it. There is a tussle between New Zealand and then Australia about who owns the right to uh, trademark the name Manuka honey. And that tussle has been there for probably since 2015. New Zealand has realized that uh, Australia has, is home to almost about 87 species of Leptospermum. And out of these 87 species, about 84 of them are native to Australia. And about half of them are known to produce this particular compound, dihydroxyacetone. And because of that, Australia and New Zealand, and New Zealand in particular, feel like if Australia catch up and then begins to produce this sort of honey, obviously they will take the market away from them. Currently, if you look at the market share, you realize that New Zealand, the whole world, New Zealand controls the lion's share, about 12%. Australia sits in the New Zealand quarter as well. But I mean, uh, Australia contribution to honey is quite small as compared to that of New Zealand. Last year alone, New Zealand produced about half a billion dollars USD from honey exports and then trade. And then the global total of, uh, the global total of uh, honey is about 2.3. So uh, New Zealand controls huge amount of this particular market. And fortunately for Australia, just three days ago, I was trading this new item, news item, and then they've been quite unsuccessful at uh, trademarking the name Leptospermum, uh, they're trademarking the name Manuka Honey. So yeah, it's still at the courts, and uh, they are expected to file uh, uh, appeal to see if they can still get the trademark name just uh, uh, I, to them alone. Yeah. So when the nanny, when the nectar is produced, when nectar is produced in Leptospermum species, the nectar sitting there in the flower has got this particular compounds. This is the main nectar mix we have glucose and fructose, and it's about 20% glucose and then 80% fructose. So it's 
fructose dominant, and then you have less than 2% of sucrose sitting there. But importantly, we have this particular compound, what we call the dihydroxyacetone. This is a three carbon sugar. I was talking about, I was giving, somebody asked me somewhere in New Zealand about what I was doing when I was doing my master's in New Zealand. And then I was like, I'm looking at dihydroxyacetone. And the person was like, dihydroxyacetone? Are you working on alcohol? I'm like, no, it's, it's not what they think. It's technically a three carbon sugar. That is really important for the honey industry here in New Zealand. And this particular compound, this one, in honey, it undergoes a conversion or it's autocatalically sort of converted into metaglousal. So the metaglousal is the main active ingredient. It's the main thing in the honey that makes or that gives its antibacterial properties. And so if you go to the shelves and you want to pick any manuka honey, these are the sort of rating you'll be looking at. And if you have a rating of 1,200 plus, it tells you that this particular honey has got high MGO in it or high antimicrobial property in it. And it's so highly bioactive. And obviously the price in there will be higher than what you buy for any normal honey. So, as I've said, the nectar component or the mix in there is notoriously variable. And we don't know what causes that sort of a variation, if it's genetic or if it's environmental or if it's just inherent in the flower. So, the main objective of this work that I've been doing all over for almost four years, I've categorized it, I've put it into two broad objectives. One was to determine the variability of DHA and sugar amounts in the flora nectar of Leptospermum species. And this is not well documented, so that is what I sought to do. And then also try to understand the biochemistry underlying the DHA production in the flora nectar tissue. And then that is being pumped out onto as a nectar. So the ideal thing to do was first, we know that the flower will open at the bud stage, and then over the period will then senesce, and out of senescence, there will still be nectar that is produced. So around this sort of spectrum, does the nectar stay the same? Does the constituent stay the same? Or it changes with flower age? And when I did that sort of analysis, what I noticed is that flower age sort of was the main factor that affected DHA production and total sugar production in the nectar. So along that sort of spectrum, the flower will live for about 16 or 21 days, and you still have nectar sitting there. And when you analyze the nectar, you find out that in the beginning, the nectar uh, will have high levels or high amount of DHA in there, but with time, the nectar, the, the levels of DHA begins to decrease. And that was also quite consistent with the total sugar amount in there. I have studied this in two clones under the same environmental conditions in, in the field. So this was an open field experiment. This was not a controlled field experiment. And this was not a, a controlled experiment in a glass house. But an open field experiment exposed to the same uh, environmental pressures or uh, conditions. And in the same, in the, in the other clone as well, you still have the same sort of profile or the same sort of pattern that goes through. You have flower age affecting the, the, the amount of DHA and total sugar. And when I compare the clones, you realize that there's a clonal differences between the two sort of uh, 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 clones I was studying. Clones also has an impact on DHA amount and total sugar amount. And the DHA to two sugar ratio is what we look at, and that's what actually affects the, 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 the amount of MGO, that metaglousal that will be produced in the resulting honey. And we notice that in flowers, or in nectar that has been exuded freshly, say within 24 hours, if I collected nectar over several times from the same flower, and then when I, let, I, let, I allow the nectar to sit over a period of time, that is accumulated nectar, you have the same level, there's no differences between what has been exuded and what was already sitting there. And this tells me that, it, it gave me the impression, and then we started thinking that probably nectar was being recycled in accumulated nectar, and the same amount of nectar sitting there goes in there, it's been resolved, and then the next day it's been exuded.
So that is how the flower sort of regulates its sort of uh, nectar. And then this nectar reception is also could, could also be um, a source of resource recapture or resource investment. Then the last experiment was I wanted to find out where the DHA and then the total sugar amount is coming from. DHA particularly is not part of plant metabolite, regular plant metabolite. So what it is is that when we first identified DHA in Leptospermum nitens, it was quite interesting because it's not really part of plant metabolites. You don't really see it. But then DHAP, that's, that had the acetone phosphate, which is an intermediate in glycolysis, photosynthesis, gluconeogenesis. You have DHAP sitting there, and that is shuffled into to form to go into glycolysis or to go into the pyruvate and then keeps on other mechanisms in there. So I was like, okay, probably DHA will be coming from DHAP. And the, what it means is that some sort of phosphatase activities or some enzyme activity will be affecting DHA amounts or will cleave the DHA in the flower and then will yield to the DHA there. Then that will be transported onto the flower surface. So to test this particular hypothesis, I sought to uh, inhibit flowers or expose flowers to sodium fluoride. Sodium fluoride is known to inhibit uh, cellular or internal uh, phosphate activity. So when I expose flowers in uh, flowers still attached to the plant, what I noticed is that uh, DHA amount was drastically reduced as compared to water treatment. And then the two cigar amount was not really different. There was a reduction though, but statistically, there is no different. And the DHA amount, uh, the tea sugar amount is an index we use to measure how much nectar is being produced. So therefore, this tells me that nectar was being produced and the effect of sodium fluoride was actually on DHA, not necessarily on the nectar. There could be some effect in there. It could affect some internal mechanisms or some internal metabolism. But uh, largely, you notice that DHA was really affected. It declined as a result of treating it with different concentrations of sodium fluoride. And when I did it in excise flour, I had the same results. And interestingly, at higher concentration, no DHA was produced at all. At higher concentration of sodium fluoride, no DHA was produced at all. Which tells me, yes, some phosphatase activity is involved in the production of DHA. So to do that, I decided to, okay, extract phosphatase and quantify its activity, gel in gel activity, to see if there's any sort of similarity or any sort of matching between DHA and then the time when peak activity of DHA is being produced. So I selected plants, at, uh, I selected flowers at day zero, at the bar stage, and then flowers that have been open for three days, and then flowers that have been open for seven days. These stages are quite significant, this because at Stage three of flower or day three of flower development, that is where we have much more nectar production coming on, DHA production also coming on. And at day seven, DHA production begins to go down. And at day zero, you don't have DHA at all. And when I did this in gel assay, I noticed that day three was where we have high DHA activity. And that is very consistent and correspond to the time we have DHA production in the nectar. So it was quite consistent telling me that some sort of uh, phosphatase activity was in there that sort of produce or cleave DHAP from dihydrogen acetone phosphate in, in the cell and then the DHA is exported or transported into the nectar. So in conclusion, what I've noticed is that, or what I noticed is that uh, DHA, accumulated DHA and sugar amount differed across flower age. So flower age was really important factor and then, and then the clones also as well. And then DHA and tissue accumulation and exudation are independent, are dependent on flower age and then clones. So therefore, there could be some genetic factors in there as well. And the ratio of DHA to tissue cigar declined with flower age and was similar between freshly exuded and then uh, accumulated nectar, which leads to what we call continuous exuded and then resolved nectar process going on in the flower. And then exposing flowers to sodium fluoride solution resulted in declined DHA amounts in the flower nectar and then LFA must have been inhibiting phosphatase activity within the nectar, thereby resulting in declined DHA amount. And then lastly, DHA phosphatase pool in the cytosol contributed substantially to DHA amounts in the flora. Thank you. 
and this is where I had tagged so many flowers. On a day, I tagged close to about 400 flowers. I was so tired, somewhere in the wheat belt. There's no trains working there, but I still got the train tracks there. So I decided to lie on the train tracks and then take the photo. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm sure there might be a couple of questions in the audience. Hi, Sylvester. Great talk, and I've been through that many times past that sign in Coolum. Um, my, my question was really around what have you, like, does beef feeding behaviour also change the DHA? production from the flowers. So a lot of your work, I assume, is from isolated flowers where you've tagged them and tracked them. Is there actually active bee feeding? Is there any response to um, the collection of the nectar and what the nectar actually produces? Okay, so basically what I sought to do was that if you see here, I tag all my flowers and then I exclude <coughs> any insect forages so as to have nectar sitting in the in the netted bag as well on the branch of the tree. So as much as possible, I excluded any insects or any bee activity feeding or collecting nectar. So what you have is a true representation of what the plant had produced over the period of time I had actually sampled the nectar. So then the variability is basically dependent on flower age and then the clones or the particular type of a species you're looking at. Yeah, so I understand that that was part of your method, but is there any work which shows that there's actually, when the bees actually, or the insects actually collect, that changes what the plants actually produce? Or is it just, is, is there any feedback loop in that system? Yeah, so basically, what I could say is that um, when you have a repeated collection, yeah. so then you stimulate that with yeah, bee collecting and then we have a repeated collection. If the flower is not sort of um, fertilized, because remember that I've said that the nectar is generally produced to add source fertilization. So if the flower is not fertilized, the plant will keep on making nectar until it, it achieves its raw, its purpose, or probably the plant and uh, the flower sinners and then uh, fertilization might, uh, might have not taken place at all. So be collecting uh, nectar, if we had simulated that with repeated collection, I have told you that uh, the DHA to T-sugar amount was not really significant from when it was sitting there, uh, accumulated nectar. So, yeah, it doesn't really affect much more of uh, what you see in there. I don't know if I've been able to answer your question. Can I just one please? Uh, uh, Nice one again. I just, my question is uh, the DHA, the influence of the environment. You, you mentioned sodium fluoride yeah. um, reduces. Uh, so if that is the case, uh, Australian environment, particularly Western Australia, is a lot of salinity. We just heard from other uh, speakers, other speaker. Uh, what compared to the New Zealand, which is much more better environment. So does the G DHA will be more in New Zealand uh, environment? Just a yeah, question. I mean, uh, true. I mean, uh, interestingly, with the species in East Coast and then the species here in uh, West Coast, the most uh, common species here in West Coast that beekeepers use is Leptospermonitans. And Leptospermonitans produce much more DHA than the single species found in New Zealand, which is Leptospermoscoparium. And uh, if, so it's no, I, I don't really see the impact of probably sodium affecting DHA amount. It's the fluoride effect that actually affects DHA amount. And that was to test if phosphatase activity actually play a role in DHA production. Yeah, I mean, there, there's so much. And as I said in my intro, we had also even identified, I've also through my work have identified other species which are different to the general leptospermum. So they are in the general uh, verticordia, and then erythromytosis spellifolia species that also produce DHA. So there's huge resource abound for Australia to produce 
bioactive honey that has the same characteristics as Manuka honey. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can we please put the hands together again? Thank you. Appreciation. Thanks a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce our final speaker before the coffee break. And um, this is Janre Amas. Janre finished his Bachelor of Science degree in agriculture majoring in plant pathology at Central Minda Mindanao University in the Philippines. He then worked as a researcher in the International Rice Research Institute as part of the salinity tolerance and problem soils breeding team. While working at IRRI, Janri pursued his Master of Science degree in plant breeding minor in molecular biology and biotechnology at the University of the Philippines, Los Banos. He then transferred to the Philippines Department of Agriculture as a senior science research specialist in 2016. Then a couple of years ago, in 2019, Janri began his PhD studies at UWA under the supervision of Professor Jackie Bately, Professor Wally Cowling, Professor Dave Edwards, and Dr. Philip Beyer, together with Angela van der Woe. His research interest is on applying cutting-edge genomic technologies to identify useful traits to accelerate crop breeding. Janri, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Matthias, for the introduction. So good afternoon, everyone. So this afternoon, I'll tell you about how we use genomics to identify disease resistance genes in brassica species. But before I continue, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank all the members of the Buckley Lab, the University of Western Australia for my scholarship, our funding bodies, our collaborators here and overseas. So now I'd like to introduce you to my subject crop species, which are the brassica species. So you're looking at the triangle of view, which basically describes the genetic relationship of brassica, brassica species. So here you have brassica rapa, brassica nigra, and brassica oleracea that carry the A, B, and C genomes respectively. And through evolution, these species have undergone ancient spontaneous hybridization to create this new set of species, which now carry both of the genome complements of the diploid species. So you have here Brassica jansia, which carries the A and B genomes, Brassica naples with A and C, Brassica carinata with B and C. So these species are economically important crops. For example, Brassica jansia and Brassica naples are canola. And this is the second most important crop in Australia, with Western Australia producing the most uh, canola seeds annually. Brassica rapa and Brassica oleracea are important horticultural crops, while Brassica nigra are typical, is typically uh, processed into condiments. And Brassica carinata is a source of biofuel. So because these crops are widely grown, they are often attacked by pathogens, which cause significant yield losses. For example, black leg has the potential to reduce 100% of the yield. Club root is a very big problem, especially in the Americas and some European countries. Sclerotinia stem rot is also becoming important disease here in, in Australia. Other diseases such as downy mildew and leaf spots are, are considered as we emerging diseases and they can potentially become big diseases if they're not addressed immediately. But the good news is these diseases can be controlled and we found that genetic resistance is the most effective control strategy. And this is mainly driven by resistance genes or simply R genes. And these genes works by interacting with the avirulence genes in the pathogen. So for example, if you have the plant cell here and the pathogen is present, and it has the corresponding AVR gene, it will produce the AVR gene product, but this will be recognized by the R gene, and this interaction trumps the signaling pathway inside the cell, and this results to the immune response, which, which is the resistance response, which is also active throughout the whole crop life cycle. In plants, there are two types of R genes. One is what we call the nucleotide binding site using which repeats. It's a mouthful, but you can call it NLRs. 
and the other one is transmembrane used in witch repeats or simply TMLLRs. And the good thing about these genes is that they're very well conserved in the genome and that actually allows us to identify them using uh, genomic approaches. So we can define genomics as a field of biology that concerns with its structure, function, evolution, and mapping of genomes. And over the recent years, we have seen advancement in brassica genomics as seen in the number of genome assemblies published for this species. So all of the species in the triangle Triangle of view now has, now has at least two genome references, including single genome reference and pan genomes. So what's the difference between a single genome reference and a pan genome? So a reference genome is a representative genome. You can think of it as a database where you can fi find all the genomic information in that species, including the, the number of genes that are present in the species, which also include our genes. However, we know that a single cultivar cannot represent the whole diversity within the, within the species, just as I myself is not a representative of the human population. Because here, if you add some more information from other cultivars, then you'll see some more genes popping up, which were not detected using the single genome reference. So then a pan genome is a better reference because it takes into account all this information. So you have here a better representation of the whole genetic diversity within the species. So within the pan genome, you can identify a gene as core genes or those genes that are present in all the cultivars and as variable genes or those genes that are present in some of the cultivars. And this genetic variation is also referred to as presence absence variation or PAV. So in my PhD, I took advantage of the availability of these rich genomic resources. And this afternoon, I'll talk about two research findings. First is on the use of pan genome for, for our genes identification in Brassicarapa. And second is on the identification of a candidate RLM6 gene against black leg in Brassicanapus. So on to my first research finding. So we used the Brassica Rapa pan genome, which was constructed from 77 cultivars, and this can be roughly grouped into 12 morphotypes, as shown in this figure here. So in total, we found at 989 R genes within the pan genome, and when we compared it to previous studies that utilize single genome references, we found that this pan genome has way more genes, and that suggests that there are a lot of genes that are missed using single genome references. So there's an additional of 234 R genes within the pan genome, and these represent the missing R genes. We also compared the composition of the core and variable genes between the TMLLR and NLRs, and we found that TMLLRs has, have more core genes over variable genes, which is in contrast to NLRs, which has more variable genes than core genes. And we think this is due to the function because TMLLRs are not only important in disease resistance, but they also act in some important biological processes such as growth and development, whereas NLRs are only implicated mostly with disease resistance. So TMLLRs has the tendency to be more retained in the genome compared to NLRs. So when we compare the number of variable genes among morphotypes, we see the differences or variability, and this is consistent to the fact that a single morphotype or a cultivar cannot represent all the diversity within a species, and it's, it's important to take into that, to that consideration when building genome references. So because Brassica rapa is a known source of genetic resistance for Brassica crop breeding, we identify candidate candidate genes within resistance genomic regions in this species. And we found that there are a lot of genes that are actually variable, meaning these genes are probably missed out it's using single genome references. And that could likely explain why it's very difficult to identify candidate genes in these uh, genomic regions. So with these results, we can, we can say that pan genomes are a powerful, powerful resource for identifying our genes in the Brassica species, but including Brassica rapa. So 
So now I will now continue to the second part of my talk, which is very specific to identification of a candidate gene against black leg in Brassica napus. So RM6 is one of the major black leg R genes mapped in Brassica species. It's named RM6 because it interacts with the AVR LM6 in the black leg pathogen. It's probably one of the first and oldest R gene map in or identified in Brassica species, but it was only recently that we we're able to locate the genomic region where it is uh, found. And it's basically in the upper arm of chromosome CO3 in Brassica napus. So we then, eight use, we then use eight genome references to identify the R genes in this genomic region because we want to cover as much genetic, genetic diversity within the Brassica napo species. So in total, we identify 63 R genes, of which 53 are TMLLRs and 10 are NLRs. So now we have a list of candidate genes, which is, by the way, still a lot of genes. So we thought of further narrowing down this candidate gene list, and we thought of sequencing them. So out of the 63 candidate genes, we successfully sequenced 33 of them. And at the end, we identify a gene we called or renamed PG16, which actually segregates between resistant and susceptible lines. So here is the sequencing data. It's just a strings of nucleotides, A, T, G, and C. But what you can observe here is that there are differences in the resistant and susceptible lines. And, this, and these differences tend to be more conserved or conserved in the resistant lines. So with this result, we picked this gene as the most promising gene among our candidate gene. And then using the sequence information, we developed molecular markers that can be used to tag this gene in breeding lines. So this time we tested them on more lines that were phenotypically identified as susceptible and resistant. So the photos here showed you the banding pattern of, the, of this marker. And the presence of white band indicate the molecular marker was amplified, meaning the gene is present. And if there's no band, meaning the gene is absent. So, and what you can observe here is the band is present in all the resistant lines. And I should also mention that a different kind of marker was also tested. We call it competitive allele specific marker and the result uh, and it shows the same result with our screening. So with these findings, we can say that our molecular marker accurately predicted the phenotype of these lines. So however, we are still not convinced about this result. So we did another round of screening, this time using Darmor. So Darmor is a cultivar that doesn't have RNA 6 but French researchers were able to develop this uh, near isogenic line by several rounds of back crossing. So I went to France to do this experiment, which was, by the way, supported by the Mike Carroll Traveling Fellowship and the Postgraduate Convocation Travel Award. So thanks to those funding. So we, we first did the phenotyping to confirm the resistant response. And we can confirm that Darmor is susceptible while Darmor RLM6 is resistant. And then we applied our molecular marker, and indeed we were able to amplify the molecular marker on Darmor RLM6, which is resistant, but not in Darmor, which is susceptible. So with this result, we have a very we think that we have found a very strong candidate gene for RLM6. So, but how would this result benefit breeding? So breeding is a long process. Take, for example, this very basic uh, breeding scheme, which usually has, starts from hybridization of parents to the development of F1 hybrids and segregating population, which then undergo several rounds of selection before you can do field trials, and then you can select your improved variety. So, but when you are selecting for black leg resistance, at some point of this breeding scheme, you will have to do a phenotyping for black leg. But phenotyping is very time consuming. It's very labor and resource intensive as well. And most of the time you will, need, you will need an expert to do the phenotyping, but still it could still yield to inaccurate results. 
So with the molecular marker that we developed, we can replace phenotyping with genotyping, and it has a lot of advantages, including that it is a very high throughput, meaning it can screen a lot of lines in one run. It's very efficient, and it's very accurate as well. So with molecular marker-assisted breeding, this has the potential to accelerate the breeding process, which can lead to faster development of improved varieties so that farmers will have more options in their crop production. And this is also very relevant to managing blackleg because we want to keep all these genes in rotation to avoid resistance breakdown. So we always say in blackleg, there, if there are more genes in rotation, there will be black leg, less blackleg infection. So as a summary, in my PhD, we have described a comprehensive repertoire of our genes in Brassica rapapan genome. And we also have identified a very strong candidate gene for RLM6, and this enabled us to develop molecular marker to tag this gene in breeding lines. And as a general conclusion, in my PhD, we have demonstrated that genomic resources for Brassica will indeed allow faster identification of genes that condition economically important traits, including disease resistance. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for listening. Thank you, Tony, for another outstanding talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Junrei. Um, I'm always intrigued um, when we find so-called R genes everywhere, and there's lots of them. Um, can you give a perspective maybe on what you think they're doing there? What, why do they exist? And why are there so many? And some of them are fixed in, across the pan genome, and others seem to be flexible and come and go. Um, so. Are they there because of disease resistance, or is it something else? Well, I think they are part of the, the evolution or adaptation of plants. So whenever these pathogens, pathogens are present, so these argent, this argent tends to like counteract the effect of these, um, these pathogens. So yeah, it's probably because they are um, the plants always respond to these kinds of um, um, path uh, um, stress. So, yeah, that's a mechanism of, of plants to actually fight off these pathogens, and they can be anywhere in the genome. I hope that answers the question. Well, that's a, that's a uh, philosophy, but it's not true, is it? So, um, you did mention in your talk that there are other possible Well, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I've mentioned in my talk that there are two types of R genes. So, one is what we call TMLLRs, and they are also important in other biological processes such as growth and development. So, yeah, they could also, yeah, you're right that they could also influence uh, other biological processes, and they're not only important in disease resistance. So, they function in a lot of ways that we, you know, we could imagine. And like, to be honest, there are still a lot of things that we don't know about our genes. But yeah, they are there, and uh, we can take advantage of them and study them. OK, thank you for the talk. I have one question. So for the major group of our genes you identified across in different brassica species, has uh, have the corresponding avalent genes being identified, or only the one in Brassica pathogen being identified? Thank you. Thank so, you. Yeah, so we know in the case of black leg, these AVR, avalent genes have been identified. That's why the genes are named after them, because they interact with each other. But for other diseases, we still don't know a lot of the the genetic architecture, because these are re the genetic resistance could be quantitative <coughs> as well. So they involve a lot of other mechanisms as well. But for, for black leg, yep, there are a lot of avalanche genes that have been identified already. Thank you.
Okay, so maybe only no only the AVI routine genes in brassica disease may have been identified. Sorry, can you repeat that? So I mean, so based on your so um, in this case means only the AVI routine genes in the pathogen causing brassica black black disease has have been identified. Well, to to the best of my knowledge, because this uh, black leg. The, the brassica black leg interaction is a very well studied you know interaction so a lot of studies have been done in that aspect so there are a lot of a virulence genes that have been identified as well but in other diseases we don't know yet because these are probably because these are like very complicated uh, diseases as well so that's another point of research probably that we could go in to identify these you know corresponding genes in these uh, pathogens Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. And I appreciate it. Thank you. And I hand back to Thank you, students. Uh, and of course, students. thanks, Matthias, for that uh, uh, chairing this session. And we are almost on time. And what we will do, we will go for a short break for the coffee. And we'll be back here 20 past 3. But the students and uh, Graham will stay here to take a photograph. Thank you. And one little present for you as well. So. Welcome back. So we'll uh, move to the second part of uh, this afternoon. Um, and there will be three uh, student speakers. So it's my pleasure to introduce the chair of the second session, Professor Sharon Purchase. Uh, Sharon is a co-leader of the UWA Institute of Agriculture, Agribusiness Ecosystem Research Team, and a highly accomplished professor of marketing within the UWA Business School. Prior to the academia, Sharon worked for 13 years within the engineering sector for both private and public organizations in marketing, sales, and consulting. While working with the CRC for honeybee products, which you heard a, a talk uh, this morning, um, afternoon, Sharon was involved in the development of a di digitized industry quality assurance system called B Equal and B Trace. During this time, she was involved in encouraging industry to improve traceability, authenticity process resulting in the suggested process for sharing providence information where it is originated from and thus improving the consumer trust. So this has been a major project within the CRC for honey, honeybee. She was also involved in a large international study on consumer honey preference to support the industry push into export market. Sharon has published academic papers in leading international journals and has been invited to join editorial boards. Please welcome Sharon. Thank you, uh, thank you, Professor Sadiq. Um, so I'd like to get going so that we are on time for the drinks and everything afterwards. I'd like to introduce our first postgraduate student for after the afternoon tea cake, uh, afternoon tea break is Mukush Chowdhury from the UWA School of Agriculture and Environment. Mukush is currently on study leave from his role as a scientist at Ikra in Indian Institute of Maize Research while he completes his PhD here at UWA. He has more than six years experience researching maize breeding and is the recipient of the Australian RTP Scholarship and the Mike Carroll Travelling Fellowship. He is supported by his supervisors, Professor Wallace Cowling, Hackett Professor Kabot Sadiq, and Professor Yuen Yan. Makisha's postgraduate research is focused on genetic dissection of meteorotic heat stress tolerance in wheat. It involves applying gen genomics and trans. Trans. <laughs> for identification of heat stress intolerant genes. Can you please welcome Makesh? Thanks, Sharon, for introducing me. Hi, everyone. 
uh, I'm going to, today I'm going to present uh, about the major findings from my PhD research on genetic dissection of heat stress tolerance at meiosis in wheat. So my research journey is going to cover the impact of heat stress at meiosis for the grain traits in wheat, identification and validation of the genomic regions followed by mining of some candidate genes for heat stress tolerance in wheat and how the generated information can help us to guide for breeding heat stress tolerant cultivars in future. First of all, I would like to acknowledge my supervisors without whose support and encouragement this work would not have been possible. I also acknowledge my family members and friends for their support and other funding agencies. So first question is why wheat is so important? Wheat is so important because not only it ensures the global food security, but also it contributes immensely to the national economy. That means like global economy as well as the national economy of the major wheat producing nations. So we can see and we should be thankful to the, uh, the earlier wheat breeders like uh, William Ferrer who started uh, breeding for the uh, elite varieties, high yielding varieties in the early 19th century and that is how they have realized like okay how uh, high yielding varieties are important in the context of contribution to the economy. So other than that wheat also provides us with the diverse food choices as we can see from the happy faces. And if we talk about wheat production in Australian context, although the wheat product, uh, Australia is on ninth rank in terms of wheat production globally, however, if we look at the export value, it contributes immensely to the uh, national economy. Uh, it is nearly 7.2 billion US dollar and uh, I would like to share that it is nearly equivalent to what US is uh, getting the uh, income through the export value, it is nearly similar to that. And that is a very good uh, thing and hence wheat uh, uh, has a significant importance in Australia. However, we can see that due to climate change over the years there has been continuous increase in the temperature as we can see from the last few decades. However, if we see especially the last decade, we, we, we can see that 8 warmest years are recorded during last decade including that uh, top 3 warmest years and it uh, makes us to feel that yes everyone is feeling hot including plants. Uh, as we all know that wheat uh, is a winter crop and hence it is very sensitive to high temperature and previous studies have indicated that if there is 1 degree Celsius rise in temperature it leads to reduction of grain production in wheat by 6 percent and that amounts to huge loss to the wheat industry. But is there any sustainable solution to this? Yes, we have uh, heat tolerant cultivars like if you breed for the heat tolerant cultivars that would be the most effective approach to tackle the problem of rising temperatures and uh, achieve uh, optimum yields <coughs> under heat stress ecologies. So considering this, uh, we uh, propose our objectives as to evaluate the impact of heat stress during meiosis on grain traits and why we choose meiosis. There are two reasons for that. First, meiosis is very sensitive to heat stress and the second, it is the least explored stage for heat stress tolerance as compared to anthesis and post anthesis. Uh, there are uh, numerous studies on flowering and post flowering but meiosis has not been explored yet and if we talk about meiosis in terms of climate change, we can see that if there is an untimely uh, rainfall and there is a delay in the planting of wheat, uh, it exposes wheat to heat stress at meiosis and there is a recent example from uh, South Asia that there was early onset of heat stress during spring that led to reduction of 15 percent uh, production uh, in the Indo-Gangetic plains in India. So that is why we, we should consider, uh, we should uh, uh, agree that uh, meiosis is very important and it, ne it need to be uh, looked for the uh, genes and breeding for the tolerant cultivars at meiosis for, uh, for the future. And uh, other objectives were to identify genomic regions as well as uh, search for some candidate genes through transcriptome profiling. 
So the first uh, uh, critical uh, point for our study was to identify like when does the meiosis occurs, because at the time of occurring of meiosis, the young spike is enclosed in the leaf sheath and it is in the stem. So first we have to identify a morphological indicator. So in our uh, pilot trials, we use some varieties and we take the main stem and investigated the auricle distance and auricle distance as we can see it is the distance between the auricle of the flag leaf which is the final leaf and the auricle of the penultimate leaf and we found that when the auricle distance is 0 0.5 to 1 centimeter that indicates the beginning of the meiosis and this stage is occurring nearly two weeks before flowering so what i am talking about is before the flowering so after identification of morphological marker we collected 30 diverse culti uh, culti wheat cultivars that were bread wheat cultivars and we exposed them to 5 days heat stress treatment following the protocol and which is a transient gradient heat stress that is like it's, it increases from the morning reaches to maximum in the noon and afternoon and then it declines back to the normal which mimics the field conditions. This is how the temperature increases and uh, decreases uh, or behaves in the field conditions and which is a very good approach. And at maturity, we recorded different grain yield associated traits and we measured heat tolerance during meiosis as the genotypes which show least reduction under heat stress relative to control can be considered as the heat tolerant. So what we obtained, we found that heat stress significantly impacts the different economic traits like grain number, sorry, uh, grain number, grain yield and the biomass and grain yield per plant and on the basis of percent reduction under heat stress relative to control, we classified the tested genotypes into two major groups. One is tolerant which showed least reduction for most of the traits and other sensitive uh, which showed maximum reduction and from this we picked two tolerant Vixen and Hellfire and one sensitive Gladius as the parents for the next study. So coming to next experiment. We use the tolerant and sensitive parents to develop F2 populations by crossing followed by selfing and these F2 populations were screened under heat stress treatment following the same protocol and we also genotype uh, these populations using SNP markers. So what is SNP single nucleotide polymorphism? If we look at uh, the genomic sequences between these two individuals we can see that for rest of the locus they are similar but at particular this locus we can see there is a single base pair change and this single base pair change can uh, will act as a marker we can identify first line with A and the second line with G. So these SNP markers are very helpful in uh, QTL mapping and that was the objective of uh, our uh, second research uh, uh, study and uh, so before uh, defining what is QTL I would like to uh, share that first uh, before uh, identifying the QTL regions, first we need to make a linkage map and what is linkage map? We can compare this linkage map just like a let us say this is a single chromosome which is similar to a highway and on, on highway we have posted our markers, the SNP markers that I talked about as a flag post and they are, uh, they, are uh, they are located or they are just placed. Uh, on this uh, uh, chromosome based on the recombination frequency and we can identify which is relative which is near to which one on the basis of relative distances between them and once we have developed our linkage map now we can use the phenotypic information to locate the QTLs for the different traits that we have recorded under heat stress. So QTL can be defined as the genomic regions which are associated with the heat tolerance as well as linked to markers and these markers helps us to select the lines which are heat tolerant for future studies. So the purpose was to identify uh, polymorphic markers between parents and then to identify the gen uh, QTLs that are genomic regions for heat tolerance. Uh, if we talk about wheat genome, wheat is a hexaploid uh, crop uh, where uh, it has seven uh, chromosomes and uh, three genomes ABD and this is how the nomenclature works for wheat. So what we find in our QTL mapping study with the Gladius Vixen F2 population is we identified three major QTLs for three different traits biomass, spikelet number and days to emphasis. Uh, 
and these three regions were found to be located between these two markers and that is why we can say that these this the, re the particular region between these uh, markers is very important and chromosome number 5a holds importance for the heat stress tolerance in wheat. Similarly, in the second population Gladius, Gladius Hellfire F2, we identified some uh, minor QTLs for three different traits near in, in the uh, nearly in the same region uh, on chromosome number 5a and we can see that one of the marker was found to be common across and this verifies that this particular region on chromosome number 5a is very important for heat stress tolerance. Later we uh, tried to find some uh, candidate genes in, in the major genomic region and we were uh, able to find uh, some important genes for the different uh, biological processes such as biosynthesis of secondary metabolites, uh, 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 signal transduction as well as metabolism. So coming to final experiment, in final experiment we used both sensitive and the tolerant parent along with their F3 progenies, we screened them under the control treatment as well as the heat treatment and then we identified on the basis of percent reduction under heat stress relative to control uh, some of the uh, most tolerant and sensitive progenies and we collect uh, on the third day of heat stress treatment we, uh, we collected spike and then we went for the RNA sequencing of the spike tissues to look at what is the molecular mechanism which is happening uh, uh, for the heat stress tolerance. So what we found is like we have received the results in the mid of this month and uh, I can uh, sh uh, show that if we, comp if we see Gladius uh, with, uh, against Vixen for the under the heat stress treatment, we can see that there is a, uh, uh, there are 10, over 10,000 differentially expressed genes and uh, nearly 4,900 uh, upregulated and 5,900 as downregulated genes. What it indicates? It indicates that there is a there is a differential expression. Like some of the genes are upregulated in the uh, one variety, the tolerant one, but those are not expressing at all in the sensitive one, and the vice versa. And these genes have been found to be involved in uh, uh, biological processes such as uh, biosynthesis of secondary metabolites, amino acid metabolism, photosynthesis as well as uh, we have identified some heat shock uh, proteins as well. So the final take home message from my study is we, uh, we know now that uh, meiosis is impacted by the heat stress and it affects the grain yield and related traits in wheat. And the, there is genetic variation that means cultivars respond differently to heat stress. Some are sensitive, some are tolerant and we have used that knowledge to identify some genomic regions and validation of those genomic regions and uh, are mining some candidate genes which need to be validated. And final take home message is that all these information and all these resources that I have generated like mapping populations, markers and QTLs, so all these can be uh, used for development of heat stress tolerant cultivars at meiosis or around meiosis we can say gametophyte development stage in future. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, if we look at the stage that I'm targeting, uh, maybe the the gametes that have been affected, uh, maybe they haven't fertilized. Uh, uh, they were not able to fertilize properly, and there was poor seed setting. 
so that has reduced the grain number and in our study we have found that grain weight was not affected so mainly the grain number has led to the reduction in the grain yield and yes biomass was reduced but uh, it was overall that i have mentioned but in terms of uh, uh, tolerant cultivars there was no reduction even there was increase in uh, some of the tolerant cultivars but there was uh, some a slight reduction in the sensitive cultivars but at overall if you look at all 30 cultivars there was reduction in biomass Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, for your transcriptome uh, study in response to heat stress, so uh, if I'm right, you focus on the specs for sample collection. Yeah. So, I'm curious why you focus on the sample collection of specs. Yeah, uh, actually, actually, the meiosis that we are targeting is it's happening only in the uh, florets that are that are the that that are in the spike. So we want to see like what is happening at the molecular level in the spikes. Um, from your transcriptomic work, yeah. were any of the genes that you identified as differentially expressed sitting under your QTL regions? Yeah, uh, I have explored only that particular region for the talk because we have received the data recently and I have found there are some genes which are located within that uh, particular region that we have identified. Mikesh, great talk. Um, I've worked in heat stress and cold stress tolerance in cereals um, at similar development stages um, and wanted your comments on the, the shared linkage and the conserved genetic regions um, around meiosis and maintaining fertility at meiosis at that development stage. Um, with your metabolite response and you know, that level of response you're getting, have you looked in terms of whether there's actually any similarities in that metabolite response to heat stress as well as there is to cold stress. We know the genetic regions are sometimes quite yep. conserved and the mechanisms are conserved, but is, have you seen um, compared to the literature in cold tolerance at that uh, same stage whether there's some similar, similar metabolite, yeah. metabolite responses in that space? Yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, I have received uh, uh, my data recently. Although I have looked for the heat stress studies, like I have found that uh, the major genomic region that we have identified. so. Previously, heat stress tolerant QTLs have been reported for the different traits, but uh, it's a very good suggestion. I'll go and look for the different st uh, stresses, uh, like uh, cold stress, we can look for the other stresses as well. And maybe we can find some common genes which are acting across the different stresses for tolerance. Thank you. Any more questions? No? Well, shall we thank Mikesh for his Thank you. Ah, thank you. <laughs> this one, this one, this one, this one. Just a second. I'll just take this one out. Okay, while they're um, organizing themselves, I'd like to present the next speaker. Bablu Hira Mandel is from the UWA School of Agriculture and Environment. Bablu completed a Bachelor of Science with Honours and Masters in Chemistry from the University of Ragushai in Bangladesh. He then joined the Bangladesh Civil Service as a lecturer in chemistry at the government Michael Manhashuhadan College in Bangladesh. After eight years teaching, he joined the Department of Chemistry at Jasore University of Science and Technology in Bangladesh as a faculty member. He worked seven years as an assistant professor before he moved to Perth to complete his PhD studies at the UWA under the supervision of Professor Zed Rangel and Dr. Sakari Solomon. Today he will be talking about the adverse effects of glycophosphate drift on wheat growth and the role of <coughs> fluvic acid to minimise the glycophosphate <coughs> drift damage to wheat growth. Please welcome Fablu. Thank you, Professor Sharon, for your nice introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to present a part of my PhD thesis. 
as you have heard that I will be talking about the role of fulvic acid in minimizing the glyphosate drift on wheat at the early growth stages. First of all, I would like to acknowledge my supervisors, Professor Jed Dengel and Associate Professor Zacharias Royman for their scholastic supervision and painstaking guidance throughout my PhD journey. I am thankful to the University of Western Australia for providing me the RTP scholarship and postgraduate award to support my study here at UWA. The modern agriculture is largely dependent on the application of herbicides to control weeds to ensure high productivity and food security. And glyphosate is the most widely herbicides in the world and it is still increasing due to the introduction of glyphosate resistant crops which help the growers to apply in crop including the pre-emergence applications. In addition to the wheat control, glyphosate is also used for other agricultural purposes like desiccating the crops terminating the cover crops as well as removing the grasslands. Due to this widespread application of glyphosate, it creates a big problem like glyphosate drift and it has become a great concern worldwide because it causes a significant damage to the sensitive glyphosate sensitive crops. So let us see what is glyphosate drift. Glyphosate drift is the unintended movement from the application site to the nearby fields in crops or vegetations. It can be during the application as droplet and soon after the application as vapors and can reach to the nearby crop fields and vegetations. But if these crops are sensitive. Usually you see the non-tolerant crops should be affected as glyphosate is systemic and non-selective herbicide. So it results substantial damage to the crop production. So how can we mitigate this? There are several management practices to reduce glyphosate drift, but it cannot be completely avoided. So, it causes damage to crops. So, how can we mitigate this damage? Yeah, according to the literature, applications of amino acids, auxins or plant growth regulators can minimize this damage. But, most of these are synthetic chemicals and fulvic acid can have a role because it is a natural biostimulant. It is, it is oddly available in, I mean, uh, from soil humic substances and have some benefits to the plant growth. So, have a look on the, what are the damages causes to wheat growth or wheat production. Very common like visual injuries. It reduces the biomasses and eventually the yield loss and grain quality. According to some report, it could be 30 percent damage of wheat production in Australia, which could bring the financial loss to around 88 million Australian dollar per year. Okay, so what are the factors upon which it depends? From the previous reports, the damage depends on the stage of exposure and the concentration or rate of drift. Obviously, it also depends on the types of varieties or genotypes it exposed. But from literature, most of the reports on glyphosate drifts, it said they, they ignored the earliest growth exposure and as micronutrients are very important. So, there are hardly some reports on micronutrient accumulation 
and obviously as I pointed there is some lack of remediation techniques. So as I was telling in the beginning that is fulvic acid has some benefits for plant growth. Regarding the it can reduce the abiotic status as, as salinity, drought or even metal toxicity. It is stimulated the physiology and as well as metabolism. It enhances the bioavailability of the major and my, micronutrients and eventually all this results the higher growth and yield. So, I have attained basically two questions in this part of my research that is how does glyphosate dip affect the wheat growth particularly root and shoot growth and micronutrient accumulation and shoot at the early growth stages. Can fulvic acid spray elevate the damage caused by glyphosate dip to wheat? So I did the experiments in glass house and it was basically in two parts. One part I explored the effect of simulated glyphosate drift using several rates and applied at the three to four leaf stages and used the most widely cultivated cultivar scepter. And the second part I explored the effect of fulvic acid whether it can alleviate the damage caused by glyphosate. So I hypothesized that different rates of glyphosate and the stage of application will affect differently to different cultivars. Similarly, the different rates and mode of application of fulvic acid could influence or could reduce the glyphosate deep damage to wheat. So from the glyphosate deep effect experiment, I summarize that it decreases the shoot and root growth, it reduces the micronutrient accumulations in shoots and most interestingly the decrease of dose dependent and the very important to select the optimum deep rate after 7 days of the treatment, I found that plant started drying, that is plant died after 7 days. So here is the some graphical presentation of the results for shoot dry weight. We can see that the shoot dry is gradually decreasing with the rate of glyphosate dip and similar finding is for the case of root length, total root length also decreases gradually with the increasing of the glyphosate dips. Before going to application the, of fulvic acid, I did a screening experiment to optimize the or find the optimum rate which can stimulate or can help with growth. So I applied several rates like from 1 to 15 gram per liters fulvic acid in 2 days on the age of 15 days after showing and on 18 days after showing and I found that yeah the depth varies the effect and as you can see the 5 gram per liter rate of fulvic acid is the uh, shows the highest stimulation or increase of shoot dry weight. So I selected this rate for the further experiment. As I have noted that fulvic acid, I applied fulvic acid for 15 days and 18 days. So to investigate the effect of fulvic acid on glyphosate damage, I applied three days before glyphosate application, that is glyphosate was applied on 18 days and fulvic acid was applied three days before on 15 days after showing and on the same day just immediately before glyphosate application and I used another 
treatment a mixture of fulvic acid and glyphosate and applied on the same day of glyphosate applications and found that the application of fulvic acid works particularly when I applied three days before the glyphosate application it it minimized the damage but the same day it did not respond like the pre-application but the mixture worked is very well and similarly on the root driveway sorry total root length it also works in the same way the pre-application showing better results and similar to the shoot dry weight, the mixture of fulvic acid and glyphosate also completely protected the damage. What about the micronutrient accumulation? Regarding the copper content in shoots, we found the similarity in the results like the growth parameters, the pre-application, sorry. The pre-application also improved the copper content, but not much like the same day application did not work the same similarly, but here it also works well. In the case of iron, pre-application worked well, but not the other two treatments. In the case of micronutrients, uh, sorry, manganese nutrient, yeah. This is works very well. Both all three applications improved the content, manganese content, but pre-application goes ahead. Similarly, for the manganese content, both the pre-applications and the mixture should did a good job actually. So, in my conclusion. The pre-application um, foliar fulvic acid application that is three days before glyphosate application can minimize the glyphosate damage at to heat at the early growth stages now, as well as a mixture of glyphosate and fulvic acid could completely prevent the glyphosate damage. So overall we can conclude that foliar fulvic acid application could be a viable strategy to reduce the glyphosate deep damage to wheat at the particularly at early growth stages. Thank you everybody for listening. Thank you, Bablu, for that uh, presentation. The insidious effects of glyphosate are far more than what you mentioned, but uh, those effects were new to me. And so uh, thank you very much. And the, um, uh, all the metallic, metallic trace elements are similarly affected by the glyphosate. It's a metal chelate inhibitor, which means it makes the trace elements not available to the plants. And fulvic acid, it's widespread and well known in the industry that a litre of fulvic acid to the hectare and you can reduce your glyphosate rate by a third. And that needs propagating. But of course, Monsanto don't want that. So <laughs> it's actively suppressed. You're a very brave man to publish against Monsanto. Thank well, you so much. Well done. Thank you for your nice presentation. I have actually two questions. The first question is there about your first graphical slide that you showed on the drift damage. My question is that um, is the glyphosate uh, drift can cause the nearby vegetation uh, 
to attain the glyphosate resistance for wheat or for the nearby weeds. And my second question is that you said that uh, use the glyphosate fulvic acid mix. So will it only benefit the wheat or what happened when the, if it, will it kill the weeds when you mix glyphosate and fulvic acid or will it only enhance the plant growth? Thank you. Thank you, Mainal. Very, very good questions. Now for the first questions, you, we know what an error of that herbicide resistance in particularly talking about the weeds. So yeah, there is a chance if you cultivate the same crop years upon years, like the weeds, it can grow the resistance. But I am not sure because I am not uh, working on that thing. And the second question, yeah, I applied fulvic acid in three ways actually. That is before glyphosate application, not mixed with this, and on the same day, just before glyphosate application. And the third treatment was the mixture of glyphosate. And I have showed that it's worked very well. I should say it completely uh, protected the damage. Yeah. The good question is that will it kill the weeds? Yeah. This needs further ex investigation or further experiment because I have not done that part. But yeah, we can do that. And it would be very nice if it could kill the weeds but protect the crops. Well, I think uh, your, your, your answer to that was you are, you are saying the drift damage to another crop. Yes. So you're more concerned about uh, the drift. other crop. So that's okay. My question is, what is the mechanism of uh, the um, synergetic effect of fluoric acid? So you, you said it's yielding more, yeah, et cetera. Okay. What is the mechanism? Okay, thank you, sir. Actually, I did some biochemical analysis regarding the oxidative stress and uh, physiology like uh, photosynthetic rate transpiration. I have not shown here due to the time bounding. So I found that glyphosate reduces the full uh, photosynthetic rate transpiration, even the chlorophyll content, but way and induces oxidative stresses, increases lipid peroxidations, increases the content of hydrogen peroxides. But when I am applying fulvic acid, this stress markers, the content is decreasing and increases the physiology like photosynthetic rate as well as it also increases some non-enzymatic antioxidant like phenols, flavonoids, even reduce the total antioxidant capacity of the plants. So maybe the, by influencing the physiology and reducing the oxidative stress and increasing the non-enzymatic antioxidants like phenols, it can help plant to cope with the damage. Okay, thank you. Is there any other questions, please? Okay, shall we thank Thank you, sir. Uh, it's okay. Okay. Um, I'd like to introduce our final presenter for the day, Marcella Del Carmen Vieira from the UWA School of Agriculture and Environment. Marcella is a Brazilian national who graduated in agricultural engineering from the University of Sao Paulo in 2017. She moved to Australia the following year where she completed further studies in environmental monitoring. And in 2020, she started her PhD studies at UWA. It's an interesting year to start your PhD yeah. studies. Her PhD supervisors are Associate Professor Benedict White, Associate Professor Theodore Evans, Dr. Fiona Dempster, and Dr. Jacob Bernson. Her research focuses on assessing the economic value of ecosystem services provided by introduced dung beetle services to Australia, another interesting topic. Her scientific approach is based on ecological modelling, impact evaluation and qualitative research. Can you please welcome Marcella?
Thank you, Sharon. Hello, everyone. I would like just to uh, acknowledge my supervisors, co-authors, and all the funding bodies, MLA, SARA, Australian Government, and UWA for making this project possible. So I might start by asking a question. Have you ever thought about a world without then the Beatles? Or you never thought about it? Well, now I would like you to imagine uh, the landscape with lots of dung, so the sight and the smell of dung deposited across the landscape. It's not a pretty picture, is it? <laughs> well, so I'm here today to talk to you about dung beetles, and I'll be talking about two things. So first, I'll be talking to you about how livestock farmers perceive dung beetles from an economic perspective, and second, I'll be talking to you about a tool to monitor dung beetle spread. So why are dung beetle important? So they can clean the pasture, right? And they also control pest flies because they are competing for the same resources. But what about if I tell you that they might save farmers some dollars? How much farmers can save from having dung beetles in their property? Well, those are important questions if we aim to invest in importing dung beetles from overseas into Australia. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with dung beetles and have seen them before, but in my research I'm focusing on the tunneler dung beetles. So uh, when the cattle and sheep dung is dropped, the beetles fly into the fresh dung, they start moving, burying the dung, making tunnels underground. And in this process, they have the ability to provide ecosystem services, like clean the pasture, control flies, and uh, increase nutrients into the soil. So going back to uh, Australian without dung beetles. So this is um, in early 60s, Australia, and had a lot of dung deposited in the pasture. And those dung would be uh, on the grass for up to a year. And in contrast, in South Africa, where some of these dung beetles are native from, uh, here is the image of uh, five days cow dung deposited, and it almost disappeared. So do you remember a world without dung beetles or Australia without dung beetles? Well, if you don't remember, I'm sure you're familiar with this image. <laughs> Um, so here is after the dung beetle introduction. So the dung beetle were introduced, introduced in the 60s as a biocontrol program to control flies and to keep clean pasture. So just a bit of a context that you remember. In the 60s was the era of the beetles in the world and was the era of uh, the dung beetles in Australia. So. Um, Okay, so now we know that dung beetles were introduced in Australia and it's important to know uh, from a farmer's perspective because farmers are the most affected by dung beetles. Dung beetles spread naturally, but if the environment is not uh, a good environment for them, the population might be low or they might not be able to survive. So agriculture management practices do matter, and that's why we are talking to farmers. And to do that, we conducted 39 interviews uh, with beef, cattle, and sheep across Australia. And that was with the aim of uh, assess private benefits and the value of dung beetles. So hopefully this can help to guide decision makers so they can target funding for environmental and agriculture programs that generate high levels of private and public benefits. Okay, so here's a photo of one of the interviews I conducted uh, over East. And um, we had really interesting conversations and I would ask farmers, are you familiar with dung beetles? Uh, do you find they uh, have any benefits in our farming system? Um, how much are they worth to you? So I'll show you some answers. So if you look here, 
uh, here we have the private benefits reported by livestock farmers and the frequency. For cattle producers, beef cattle and producers who also had sheep. So the, the first main private benefits was animal improvements, animal health improvements. So anything related to reducing flies, which uh, consequently reduce uh, the costs with uh, veterinary products. The second main benefit was uh, increasing productivity. So any sort of mention of uh, cleaning the pasture and increasing pasture growth. And the third was soil improvement. So any um, biological, chemical, or physical soil improvements. And as you see, soil improvement was the benefit most reported by producers. OK, and what about when I ask them, how you identify the benefits, but um, how much are they worth to you? As you can imagine, that is a very difficult question. And 64% had no idea. And only 36% were able to provide me some sort of quantitative measure. So now I'll show you some quotes of uh, the interviews from those 36%. So here we have a cattle farmer that mentioned that dung beetles uh, can save them about $190 per hectare per year because they reduce flies and costs with veterinary products. Another farmer mentioned um, almost double, $300 per hectare per year, and uh, they included also fertilizer, reduction in fertilizer because they increase uh, nutrient in the soil. And we also have some producers who um, measure their value as increase uh, in output, so as weight gain, about 15 to 22 kilograms per hectare weight gain per hectare after the dung beetles were in their property. Um, so here we also have uh, about producers who also had sheep, 10% in savings because there is more grass, uh, between 50 and 100 uh, dollars per hectare per year in savings because they're putting fertilizer in the soil. Okay, so uh, we found that quantifying dung beetle benefits is very hard and we wanted to understand other uh, knowledge gaps that farmers wanted to know better, which might guide research and development. So there were a, a high need uh, from the interviews, a high need uh, from understanding survival rates and competition with the native species, the optimal number of dung beetles per hectare and the role of dung beetle on carbon sequestration. So, um, like I said before, dung beetles, if the environment is not a good environment, the dung beetle might fly to another uh, farm to look for a better dung. So, I would like to think about dung beetle as a technology, but it's a different technology. Most agriculture technologies are machinery, pasture variety, or chemicals. But dung beetles can have a passive adoption because you can just wait for uh, the beetles to fly into your property. But of course, um, there are management practices to encourage and support the dung beetle population. And if there is a lot of pasture falling, it might be the case that the productivity gain from other technologies might be reduced. So here is what came up from the interviews. There was a lot, uh, a lack of knowledge about chemicals, drenches, and specifically negative effects on the dung beetle population. So one producer said um, many companies claim to be dung beetle friendly, but they don't really know if they are, and there is not a lot of information out there. So just before I change topic slightly, I would like to show you um, this little video of a dung beetle in Brazil doing its work uh, uphill. And uh, just as a note, this is a roller dung beetle, but the one I'm working on is the tunneler dung beetles. Okay, so understanding the value of dung beetle and the private benefits is a part of the equation, but we also need to understand how they spread in different environments. So, um, so if, it, if you think about, okay, uh, I can dung beetles spread naturally. They do, you're right. 
but do we have the budget and time to go to the field and monitor them after they were released? Probably not. So this spreading model um, comes in as a tool for land managers and hopefully they can guide land managers to where and when to introduce land beetles. So just um, like I said, it's a low cost alternative to monitor biocontrol agents post release. And the way the model works, just briefly, we have the different species introduced from Africa and Europe into Australia. We have lots of inputs like um, reproduction rate, uh, the cl climate that is favorable for each species, and um, like the number of uh, species released, and the model predicts the spread and the abundance of beetles per grid cell every six months. So it's a very detailed model. And then we validate with limited data that we have. We validate our model. So just so you understand uh, what I'm talking about. So here is um, a prediction for five years after the initial release of one species and 10 years after the, the initial release, and also the abundance. Okay, so this spreading model is a tool for planning and monitoring biocontrol program, and it can also help stakeholders to access how long it's gonna take for a program to achieve its aim. Uh, in this case, dung burial or pest control, and also might help with uh, economic valuations. So to finalize, I would like uh, just to recap and say I showed you first the interviews with farmers to assess uh, private benefits of dung beetles and the value, and most producers identified soil improvements as the main benefits. Then I showed you the spread model that predicts the abundance and the rate of spread of dung beetle as a low-cost alternative to monitor beetles. And the third part, I won't have time to talk here, but if you're interested, we can always talk afterwards, is I uh, understand the economic impacts of dung beetles on uh, stocking rate. Thank you very much. That's a really good question. Um, okay, so I think there are a few things that we need to take into account because there are different uh, types of dung beetles. So there are the dung beetles that just move the dung across the landscape, there are the baller runners, and there are also the tunneler. But with the tunnelers, which would be the one that has most impact in the soil, different species have different depths of dung burial. So that would have... Um, an impact on soil health and structure. Also, like maybe perhaps the size of the beetles. Uh, there is a limited study, so uh, there are people um, in this group also looking at uh, different species and how that might affect. But yeah, in New Zealand, um, the impact might be slightly different because um, 
Also, we have a lot of dairy, which is very intensive. So uh, a lot of much more dung deposited in the soil. So um, yeah, that's a whole different thing as well. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Excellent presentation. I just have a simple question. Um, your sample number is 39. Are you happy with that? Say again. 39 is your respondent's survey. 39. Is Three that nine. Right? Yeah, 39 num farmers? Oh yeah, number of is that reviews. good enough? Uh, yeah, uh, so that yeah, that was also because I started my PhD during COVID. So I don't want to be here and talk to you about um, my results as um, representative for whole Australia. So I would say it's representative from the areas that um, I interviewed the farmers, which was in the southwest region of uh, Western Australia and uh, mainly New South Wales near Armadale. Okay. And yeah, there are limitations because, yeah. yeah thank you. Uh, sorry, other than the perceived benefits, are there also any perceived cons of using dung, uh, dung beetles? Mm, that's a good question. Well, um, I haven't heard from the interviews, but what uh, some people mention, some producers mention that it, there is a lot of information out there saying about the benefits, but they don't necessarily see. So for example, uh, they might see, they might hear a lot of people saying, oh, they reduce uh, pest flies, but in their specific farming system, they still have a very high population. It's difficult to say if they didn't have done better, if that would be more, but um, that would, yeah, that is what I would say it's. Yeah. So I've got a second question. Um, are there any other alternative organisms that have the same uh, niche as dung beetles? So, sorry, I didn't. Yeah. Alternative niche or um, function or task? Mm, yeah, I, I don't know. I can't comment on that. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no worries. Thank you. I have some simple question. It's not a question, maybe funny. Uh, you said dung beetle made a tunnel, and uh, how deep the tunnel can be? So it can be, uh, most species would be between zero and 20 centimeters, but some species go up to a meter deep. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, just a question about public. Uh, research funding, as a result of your investigation, do you recommend that the Australian government reinvest in dung beetle research, which it stopped doing about 20 years ago? Um, Western Australia had a very famous scientist, Dr. James Ridstall Smith, who was part of that process of introducing dung beetles, and then it just got stripped out of the funding system. Mm -hmm. So is there a case to reinvest in public research? That's a good question. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, I won't say much because my uh, analysis with the interviews with farmers is current, but the other part of my analysis are historical to understand the impacts of dung beetles on livestock productivity. So um, that might have a better, um, my guide better, but... Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, yeah, give my, my answer to that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that my supervisor. Ben, ben oh, sorry. So I did you get yeah, somebody you else? Oh, just, you mentioned um, New Zealand, things have moved on. Sean Forgey, can you speak to that? Say again? Sean Forgey, Dr. Forgey in Auckland, he's, got, uh, he's, he's, done, it, he's done what we've done mm -hmm. in Australia over 50 or 60 years in 10. Uh, he's got his own, um, but a different funding model. 
Yeah, I think it, like the results now is a big project, and uh, it's all over um, Australia and New Zealand. I guess the results, all the results combined uh, from myself and other PhD students and postdoc, my guide that decision better. But like you said, the program stopped for a long time, so as uh, the research on them, so it's. Uh, so, so this is this is by, more by way of a comment because I ask myself plenty of questions. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So uh, MLA have restarted done a bit more research and they they're doing some introductions. So they've invested around about I, I, I could be I could be off because there's a big project across the country. It's about two million, but but dung beetles are quite expensive to introduce because of the biosecurity <coughs> restrictions. And so it's a slow process. And CSIRO are starting to introduce some, some new new species to cover gaps in the, the seasonality of dung beetles. And Associate Professor Theo Evans from this university is uh, heavily engaged in a cross border work on uh, dung beetles and is very significant part of the national consortium. Just a, just a comment. In New Zealand, they introduced something called Operation Airflow. I think similarly, it was following on Boris' request. I think Department of Primary Industry, under the leadership of Ben, <laughs> <laughs> Operation Dumb Beetle. <laughs> that they encourage school children to go and introduce earthworm and dumb beetle. They make some money and also then, I think that's one approach we can do. Any others? Okay, thank you. Can everyone thank Marcel? Thank you. <laughs> so let's say thank Sharon again for coming and sharing the session. So Well, this is coming to an end. I've got a few more little things to do. So congratulations to all our present days today. I think um, you all will agree that the PhD candidates has done a fantastic job. Complex project, industry related. Most of them had a industry sting or a tail at the end of the beginning and the end. So that's really good. They have practiced very well uh, with the help of their supervisors, but more importantly from Emeritus Professor Graham Martin. Where is he? Uh, he's sitting there. So this he has been doing for the last uh, 17 years. So give a big applause. So university doesn't pay him anything for that. So that's coming from the bottom of his heart. But I've been pay, uh, giving him 17 bottles so far. So that's pretty good. No, he did. Uh, so I think a uh, number of rehearsals. And I think uh, this will go a long way uh, for the students. I'm sure some of them are using their CVs and things. They were chosen for the postgraduate showcase. Uh, and now uh, um, Rosanna has really uh, done the certificate laminated. So definitely it will help. So this is not a simple thing. You have gone through a process. You have been selected. You have, you, some of you were very nervous to begin with. Not here today when you were approached but I think you all have done. I'm also very happy to see Doraid here. So that's a little story which is not in my speech notes. So Doraid was one of the uh, 25 master's students I brought here from Iraq, supported by then uh, government of uh, Australia, later on Iraqi government supported. But Doraid uh, coming from, if I get uh, the place right, Duke, Duke University, uh, in northern Iraq, and guess what? Um, our head of the school is not here. As usual, Doraid had a degree in agriculture science, agriculture college, three-year degree. All others had the four-year program. And our university, I won't tell, uh, some of the admin staff said, no way, Doraid can get into master's program because it's a three-year program. Whereas uh, we used to have a four-year program, now we're back in three-year program again. Phil is coming now for the drinks. 
so, <laughs> at the right time. So what I said was that don't tell me what I cannot do. Tell me what I can do. This is my usual approach in the system here and elsewhere. So they came back and said, uh, look, uh, Professor Sadiq, we can do something. We can admit him to a one-year program leading into potentially uh, uh, honors. So I said, let's do that. Then the problem is that uh, then the Australia Award scheme, which is equivalent to that kind called Al-Zaid, says no way. We're only sponsoring the master's students. So I took the phone and uh, talked with the director general and minister in Iraq and said, put pressure in Canberra and convert that. And so they did agree. And then the raid was admitted for an extra year doing first class honor, uh, honors. And he did achieve the first class honors with the support of our animal science colleagues. And then he was admitted to master's and did a master's, so three years supported by there. And he had to go back briefly to Iraq and come back. So that's a very, very, absolutely a brilliant achievement. <laughs> now, before we finish, I, I'd like to share our upcoming events. So this is the uh, first one is uh, the, um, is that right? Yes, first one is the Industry Forum. Uh, that's a 2023, paving the way for next generation W agriculture. This is really going to be bigger than Banner. There's a lot of interest. We have already got um, nearly over 200 people registered. 250, I don't know how we're going to accommodate. So this is again our um, um, 17th uh, consecutive forum. And then opening address will be delivered by Agriculture Minister Honorable Jackie Jarvis. And there's a number of uh, line of speakers there. So you still can take registration. The next one is, uh, if I get it right, UWA Farm Open Day. And this happens only once in two years. All are invited. It's free. We're going to arrange buses, depending upon the numbers, from the Crawley campus to Finjali and return back. We have a number of uh, people interested. We have invited the minister again. And of course, we will in in invite the deferred uh, director general, and there will be a free lunch and things, so students in particular are encouraged to come, right? Then what do we have? Yeah, there's a student who is working with us, again, um, with the business school, uh, and that is about the logistic of uh, about the grains industry, how they make the decision in relation to selling or transporting to the CBH, what, what are the challenges and things. It's supported by GGA bursary as well. I think that's it. Yeah. So once more, I would like to congratulate our talented students on their presentation today. Give special thanks to our chief scientist, Dr. Ben Biddle, our chairs, Associate Professor Matthias Leopold, he's not here, and Professor Sharon Purchase from the Business School, and of course, uh, Emeritus Professor Graham Martin, and also my colleagues from IOA, Institute of Agriculture, Rosanna, Diana, Deborah, then of course my co-associate director and Cora Castings, co-associate directors, um, Wallace Cowling and Phil always come towards the end and he's uh, here for the drinks. <laughs> so thank you again. Let's just join the Bailey's foyer for some refreshments and mingle, particularly the students should meet uh, some of the people, industry people, etc. Thank you once again.